By the way, can I also add, I met Soviet Jews who did not feel that they were living in, one of our guides was a woman named Iskra who was Jewish, and she said, I don't know what you're talking about in terms of anti-Semitism. One of the bus drivers we had was a guy who was a Jew, and, and we asked him, you run to anti do you feel the government is anti-Semitic, do you feel discriminated against? He says, no, not at all, no. And, and I said, so why, do, why, do, why do people want to leave? He said, Pete, there's always some people who want to leave, then let them leave, you know, and that, that was his attitude, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yes, I was on crossfire with Reed Irvine. And Why did you have to remind me? <laughs> and um, he asked if you were a Marxist, and you said yes, and then no. Um, are you a Marxist? Or are you not? Are you a Marxist? Or are you not? I said, and this is my answer, I would wear that label proudly if I knew that you understood what I meant by Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> And when somebody like Reed Irvine says, you're a Marxist, aren't you, His, whose only intention is to give a buzzword which says this guy drinks the blood of a capitalist children or something, <laughs> then, then I'm going to say, no, I'm not, I'm not your label. I don't particularly want your label. That, that, that was why I, I, I deferred from the label Marxist. And, and you see, there's something about saying Marxist when I write a book about the media. And you remember the point I made? I said, look, I wrote the book about the media. I don't know what Karl Marx has to say about 20th century U.S. media. I think he had very little to say because, you know, he left early. But, um, but there's been a lot of creative thought and scholarship in Marxist literature and whatever else, and, and, uh, and, and I feel that it's, it's, it, it was, it's like a scholasticist thing. Oh, you took your formula and you applied it here. I don't see this, these things that way because I'm a Marxist. It's the opposite. I started seeing these things and then I began realizing that there was an analysis that had explanatory power for that. It gets very frustrating, you know, for years I'd knock myself out trying to make an analysis. I'd come to the conclusion, I'd say, hey, you know, the police are not neutral. They're on the side of property and power. And somebody would say to me, that's a Marxist. Would say, you know, you're, yeah, you sound like a Marxist. <laughs> it's a Marxist, oh. And then I said, hey, you know, wealth is largely unaccountable in many of the things it does in our democracy. I, I understand, that isn't what I learned. So that's a Marxist point of view. That's Mar Marx said that, you know. Mar and it would go on, one thing after another. Every time I, and I said, boy, this Karl Marx was really something, you know. Every time I put two and two together and come up with a good analysis, they give him the credit for it. <clears throat> yeah. I didn't say Cuba was so great. I said that it was a, 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 a very real improvement over what it had before, and that in some ways, comparing it even to a rich Western industrial capitalist society, it came off better, like in the area like healthcare. As far as homosexuals, um, the attitude in Cuba, I think, I think people got it wrong. Here I'll quote Saul Landau, who knows probably more about Cuba than any other American I know. His argument is that the oppression of homosexuals is not something the Communist Party does. That if it wasn't, if there wasn't the thin red line of the Communist Party in Cuba, most of those homosexuals would have had their brains beaten out. That the gay phobia, the homophobia, and the anti-gay attitudes are part of the Latino Cubano population, and that in fact there has been an attempt to change that. And the feeling is very strong about the maricon, you know, all that sort of thing. And um, I was in Cuba. My only contact with gays was I walked along the street one day and met a gay guy who was obviously cruising and tried to hit on me and I talked to him while I said goodbye, no thanks. Um, and, and the other, ex but, but he was pretty upfront, he wasn't looking over his shoulder and saying, uh, don't tell anybody, compañero, will you? Um, <laughs> although it was rather late at night anyway. But the other, uh, other contact was at the ballet, the, uh, the, um, the Alicia Alonso, you know, the, the National Ballet of Cuba Half the audience were upfront gays. I mean, it was pretty evident. Half the audience were upfront gays. They, they, were, they were there. There is a gay community in Havana, a very real one. I think, though, gay life is restricted. It doesn't have the kind of cultural freedom that you have here. You can't, for instance, write gay novels and expect to get them published. So there's still that restriction. The old restrictions against gays working in certain occupations, specifically working in teaching, under the old prejudice that the, the gay in the school will start trying to molest the little kids and all that, that's been eliminated. Today, 
nobody is denied any job in any occupational area because of sexual preference in Cuba. But there still is, um, there still is work to be done there. And I would say there are real criticisms you can make about that situation. But it's improved over the last 20 years. In certain respects, depending on how you measure it. The solidarity labor movement in Poland doesn't exist anymore. It's been broken. I supported the uh, very real and legitimate complaints that solidarity made uh, in Poland, which was that there was a Polish government that was corrupt, that it had drastically mismanaged things, that they, they'd gotten itself into a national debt, which now called for cutback. Here's what the Polish, here's what the Polish government did. They said, we want to have major capitalization and industrialize. But we also want an increase in consumer goods and consumption. Now, how do you do both those things? How do you use your capital for capitalization and use it also for consumption, increasing consumption? Oh, they found a way. There were Western banks who would lend them the money. And somebody forgot to sit down with his calculator and see what does a million dollars do at a certain percent interest over a certain number of years. You know what it does? It grows and grows and grows and grows. And suddenly, when those notes came, uh, came due, the Polish government turned around and said, oh, we goofed. In order to pay these notes, they have to do what all countries had to do under the IMF and the World Bank. Well, IMF, really. What the IMF does when the bucks are out there and you're not paying it, they introduce what's called a stabilization program, which means, very simply, you've got to cut back on consumption. Consume less uh, uh, for your workers, less social service, less that, so you have more money and more, give them less, more to export, more to earn, more to pay back our debt. So the government turned around to the workers right around Christmas time too and said, sorry, we're going to have to put a freeze on this, put a freeze on that, cut back on that, cut back on meat consumption, so forth and so on. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And the workers went out with a whole array of very real grievances. I also supported them in the subsequent months where, when, when the government did what often many vested governments do, or, 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 or your average college dean, stall, uh, uh, not uh, agree to the agreements and then not carry some of them out and all that sort of thing. I did not agree with solidarity when Lech Wałęsa, who was after all a close associate of Jack Kuren of Kor, who himself is a right winger, a close associate of Milczewski, who was head of the Confederation for an Independent Poland, who was an open fascist sympathizer, when Lech Wałęsa got up and said, and who, by the way, is an open admirer of Ronald Reagan. The Harvard International Review has an interview with him and say, what do you think? And Lech Wałęsa volunteers, Ronald Reagan is a great president. When he said, we will be moving towards state power, I didn't support that move because I believe that the solidarity leadership was anti-socialist right wing. I believe the kind of anarcho-syndical worker ownership they had about the factories was so half-baked that the economy would have been totally wrecked. They had no plans as to how that system would work. How would you get the steel to the shipyards? What if, you, what if, a, what if a factory decided to move into a new line? What do you do about the fact that some factories are far more productive than others? What do you do about social services? How do you reallocate the sur surplus value so that you can have services for people who can't work? All those questions were never dealt with by solidarity. So that's my criticism of solidarity. Yeah. Well, you see, d d just drop that kind of loaded vocabulary of workers' paradise. And, and let's get back to your original statement about you said that the Soviet worker has it so much better than the American worker. In certain aspects, I said in terms of job security, pension, retirement, um, protections against inflation, that sort of thing. If you want to measure it in terms of numbers of color television sets, even television sets now, 90, 97% or whatever, very high, 90-something percent, of the people all have television sets. The only areas are certain remote parts of the country. There's no television yet. But everybody's got television sets, so big deal. Uh, East Germany, um, there's several things that happen there. Again, it's a question of brain drain. 
Again, don't remember, don't forget that after that during World War II, it was the eastern part of Germany that got the bulk of the Allied bombing. So when the partition came, East Germany was a much more severely damaged area than West Germany. Don't forget also that the Soviets then made a strategic mistake. They started looking for reparations and they stripped some of the heavy machinery from East Germany. Whereas the West started pouring billions of dollars into West Germany. So there was a tremendous consumer prosperity in West Germany. Don't forget also that a good portion of the population in East Germany were Nazis and Hitler sympathizers. A good 20% of the people. And they wanted to get the hell out and things were not good for them. And one of the first things the East German governments did was get rid of 80% of the teachers who had taught under Nazi Germany and collaborated with Nazi Germany. Got rid of a lot of the judges. Got rid of a lot. Well, those people and their families wanted to get west where they could have a more comfortable time. And then again, there's that hemorrhaging and brain drain, which the East Germans were not inclined to tolerate. And so they sealed their border because that kind of migration would have seriously interfered with their um, economic development. Today, East Germany is about the what? The sixth or seventh most powerful industrial country in the world. It's only got 18 million people in it and very prosperous. And, and very prosperous. All right, could I, can we go on to the next person? I think I, you, you asked me a couple of questions that you see. Uh, uh, you asked me a couple of questions which really require very complicated and protracted answers given the abyss of information, the dearth of information in our country about, about these things. What we have is a few Q things. Oh, the East Germans wanted to jump across the wall. They weren't free. What do you think about that? Well, it's time we start thinking about that and getting some information as to what were the things behind that. And I just gave you what was my answer. And there are other people online. Yes. Uh, you could read Al Szymanski's book, Is the Red Flag Flying? Szymanski is spelled S-Z-Y-M-A-N-S-K-I or Y? I think it's a Y. Uh, another book he wrote called Human Rights in the Soviet Union. You might want to look at Mike David Dow's book called Cities Without Crises, which is about urban affairs, although David Dow does gush now and then. There's still interesting information in there you can glean from that. Um, even the more standard uh, Sovietologists who are critical, like Alex Novi or Sam Hendel, read them. They're, they're still better than the US media because they'll give you a lot of the hard information. Szymanski based most of his stuff on, on American Sovietologists. He says, of course, they have the ideological anti-Sovietism and all that, but they do provide very interesting information. So you could maybe start with those people. Louis Moros and um, um, uh, Progress Publishers has a number of books on Jews in the Soviet Union, which you might want to look at as an alternative. Just look at it. Get a copy. You can then poo-poo it and throw it against the wall, but, um, but, but uh, just take a look at that. And um, I don't know, there isn't any one really single volume, I think, that treats all this. Someday I'll write it. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious, I'm keeping a file on all this. Periodicals, uh, People of the Daily World occasionally have a story, political affairs. Um, there are the other ones that come, uh, uh, what, what, anybody know n the New Masses, or what's that one? No, world, uh, New World Affairs, or... I can't remember now. Um, Soviet Life. There's a publication you might want to look at. Soviet Life is a very, by the way, very beautiful, beautiful layout too. You might want to look at that. If you want to get a different impression, if you get, you begin to see their real, like human beings living there and doing things and all that sort of thing. You might want to look at that. Okay. Yeah. And our national debt. 
Well, I, 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 well, I'm glad you're helping my, me in my ignorance, but uh, my reading of the figures, my reading of the figures is, is that, um, is that if you look at the budget, the payments for welfare are, um, if you eliminated all those payments, you would eliminate about 5% of your budget. So how could that explain, how could that explain the deficit of 220 billion? Welfare payments come to about, about uh, what, about six, six, seven billion dollars for aid to families with dependent children. In fact, it's been cut and it's very insufficient for what exists. But if you look at that, the two largest items in our budget are military spending and the 150 billion a year now that has to come out to service the national debt. By the way, what is a national debt? It's money which the government owes. That means us, future taxpayers. That's how Reagan has floated this whole thing. He's taxing the future. He's taxing your future. It's money the government owes to financial houses, rich creditors, and banks, when they buy up all these treasury bonds. And then the government has money to go on spending. And as Karl Marx said in Capital, Volume 1, of all the, of all the commonwealth that is supposedly belongs to the people, the one thing they definitely own is the national debt. And you're going to be paying that for years ahead. Well, $150 billion off the top, $300 billion for military spending, that's $450 billion. That's most of our budget there. So how can you tell me the deficit is being caused by welfare spending? The figures just don't seem to support that position. Maybe you should look at the figures before you go around calling people ignorant. Okay, let's have the next question. Let's have the next question. Take over, right, the Soviets. Yeah. I was wondering if you could perhaps um, comment on that, that claim to the going and what kind of uh, strategies you might recommend for, for countering some of the uh, propaganda potential of that. Well, you know, uh, a very interesting development. I'll take the second question first. The Washington Post now comes out with a Washington Post magazine every Sunday. In the first couple of Sundays, it was kind of racist. I mean, it was really, it was crappy. There were things in there that did not sit right about black youth who go into stores and all that, uh, the problem of shoplifting, when in fact, by the way, all the statistics show, even in Washington, that shoplifters cut across the complexion spectrum and the income spectrum. And, you, and, and some shoplifters come from Georgetown, wherever else, they have, they, have a, they have a problem with all sorts of people. But these kind of things, what the people, what the people started doing, you know, black people, they organized a throwback it was called, I think. And every Sunday, they take their copy of the Washington Magazine, they go down to the Washington Post, and they heave them into the front door of the Washington Post, big piles of them. And they started off with 70 people, and now it's up to about 350, and these things are piling in there. And Ben Bradley is kind of kicking them away, and it's, and it's changed the Post, and it's gotten some publicity, by the way. So maybe what we have to do is call back. I always say, call back, talk back, call into ABC, complain, write letters, Say, what is this kind of crap? What are you doing? What is that supposed to accomplish? What kind of cheap, rotten, sensationalist? As, to far, as for the content of the program itself, we've, I've seen it. It hasn't been shown yet, but I've seen it. It's called Red Dawn. It's called Invasion USA. It's called Rambo 4, 2, 3, um, I watched Red Dawn, I watched Invasion USA, and you see these Russians, Cubans, Invasion USA was interesting, kind of Arab, Cuban, Russians, they're a whole mixture of these guys, Gaddafi, <laughs> Libyans, and they, were, ha, 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 and they were coming in, shooting people, turning the people against the police, and they were taking over the country, and nobody but uh, Chuck Norris understood the situation. <laughs> the State Department couldn't quite grasp it, the Pentagon couldn't, couldn't quite know what was up, and Chuck Norris got up there with his two machine guns, and he went, bada, 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 and he got a few vigilantes, and they started the confrontation right about the edge of Washington, near my neighborhood, they stopped them. I was relieved, you know. Um, well, what we have is very simply the fact that the line between entertainment media and news media is blurring, just as the line in their heads is blurred between fantasy and reality. And so they're trying to blur it for us, and so you get these, these kinds of pictures. That is part of a basic paradigm which has permeated the media for years. 
You can see it in the jungle movies. You can see it in the cowboy movies. You can see it in the science fiction movies. It is the paradigm, the model of the wagon circle. The wagon's circle, the fort, the camp, the city embattled by the aliens from outside. Here, inside this wagon, are discernible human beings, warm light, mothers tucking their little ones under the chin and putting them to bed. Outside the periphery of the wagon circle are the screaming savages, who, for reasons not understood by anybody, are driven by one thing, which is a bloodlusting, to kill the human beings who are inside the camp, the city. The aliens from outer space, they can take all sorts of forms. In invasion of the body snatchers, they came as pods, as vegetations that came into people's nostrils and turned them into zombies. What a movie. I, I, I cursed the person who dragged me there, and I had to sit through it because uh, she had the car. <laughs> um, they had the car. There's a couple of them. You, know, you outvoted, so you sit through the thing. Um, or it could be Godzilla emerging from the ocean to impose his urban re re renewal project on downtown Tokyo. You know. But in any case, there's this monster who just wants to come and kill and tear and attack us. These screeching savages, red, brown, black, different races, who are not there. They're not defending their land. They're not defending their herds or their food supply or anything like that, their families, their tribes. They're just there because they're hell-bent on attacking us. There's an evil empire out there, and all it wants to do is expand and attack. It's a model which then, by the way, it's one thing, you know, and you run into a student's, and then, by the way, that's transposed into explicitly political movies like Red Dawn, Invasion USA, White Knights. A student of mine last year was teaching at Brooklyn College, and he said, well, if that's true and you think we can no negotiate, how come in this movie with Baroshnikov, right, White Knights, the guy said this and this, and the other guy said that, and then the Soviet guys tried to entrap them? I said, well, maybe it's not like it was in that movie. Maybe real life is different. One of the advantages of coming to college is you don't have to rely on Hollywood anymore for all your data, you know? Um, well... Now, it's one thing when a student believes it, but when the President of the United States believes it, when he comes out of Rambo 4 and says, now I know how to handle the Sandinistas. Aha, uh -huh, a joke, a joke, you know, like uh, uh, war's been declared, we bomb Russia in five minutes, joke, you know. My grandmother used to say, uh, you know when a man for sure is, is telling the truth three times. One when he speaks when he's drunk, when he's angry, or when he's joking. And then I always thought of Ronald Reagan, always thought of grandma uh, when that was said. Um, well, that's the paradigm that supports U.S. foreign policy in that sense. I mean, I mean that there's this evil empire that inexorably ex wants to expand. It's very functional, and that's why ABC is putting that movie on. And we should tell them to stop trashing our minds. Thank you. Let's get to the next person. This is going to be a hot one. Oh, don't apologize. Look, you, you speak English a lot better than most of us speak German, so that's okay. First of all, I appreciate your concern about the things that go wrong with the society and that there is a need to desire to work on that and, and work for an improvement. One thing, however, that kind of confused me tonight is the way when you, you're comparing things. You're taking America, comparing it to something which is entirely good, and saying America is bad because it cannot keep up with the standard. Then you're taking the Saudi system comparing it to something that would entirely not work, and saying, oh, well, they're working, it's going well. You, throughout all the time, you're avoiding direct comparison. The importance of direct comparison is not to lead away from our own problems, but no, to find out if the other way is actually a better way of going. I see. Well, I think it's a very good criticism if that was happening. If, in fact, I was being very selective in my data and, and taking the worst aspects of American society and comparing them to imaginary things in the Soviet Union. But I thought I was making direct comparisons just as you wanted. I was comparing the condition of labor in this country to conditions there in terms of job security, and wages, that sort of thing. I was comparing the willingness to negotiate here with the willingness to negotiate there. Um, look. You don't have to like that society, okay? You don't have to like it. 
What gets to be a problem is when you get people like E.P. Thompson and others who say, we can never have uh, peace until we also have freedom in their country, and therefore every dissident must be free to say whatever he wants, and they should change their social order in any way we dictate, and until we do that, we can't get an arms negotiation. Well, that's a new position in the history of world diplomacy. A sovereign state goes forward, and by the way, that was affected at Reykjavik. That's exactly what Reagan does. The closer they get to arms agreement, the more he then moves to say, what about Afghanistan, and what about human rights in your society, and what about this? Where do you get off dictating to another leader? Why Gorbachev could turn around and say, I'm not gonna have an agreement with you until you take care of the homeless, or until you stop oppressing the American Indians, or the blacks in Mississippi, or, or Chicago, or wherever else. Or what about this or that? Or what about the racism in your society? You can go on with what's wrong in various societies or what you think is wrong in each society. The question I'm saying is, you don't have to like the Soviet Union, and you can keep your image of it, but just don't blow up the world that I live in and my children live in because you've got such a grudge against them, okay? Just don't blow up 240 million Soviet citizens because you don't like the policy of their leaders and their, uh, whatever else. You talk to Soviet citizens, they seem to like their leaders. And their, not all of them. I don't know any country you can go to where you can find everybody who likes everything and everything and, 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 and everything their leaders do. So that's all I'm saying. I, 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 don't really, I don't really think I can say anything more about internal Soviet society. I do think, though, it's a blatant distortion when you say they're riddled with inflation when there ain't inflation. And I, think it's, it, I don't think it's unreasonable to point that out. I think it's a blatant distortion to say that they can't feed their people when they do feed their people, when it's one of the few, when you've got a country here where we don't feed hundreds of thousands, millions of people, where the Citizens Committee on Hunger and Malnutrition has come out and said malnutrition and hunger is back in the USA. You can go into neighborhoods in Detroit, in Mississippi, in Indiana. When I lived in Illinois, you can go to Carbondale, Illinois, in the richest farmland in the world, and you'll see kids, white kids, hungry, got nothing all week, what they have all week, Kool-Aid. Right you can see it in Amherst, I guess. And then that's all. The fastest social growing group in the, Uni in the United States are the poor. Since Reagan has come into office, they've gone from 24 million below the poverty level to 35 million. I don't think that's a selective or unfair comparison. And I don't think everything in America is bad. I think the struggles and the freedoms that we have fought for and have tried to maintain, which allow us to talk right here now without the goon squads coming in as they would have done 100 years ago in this country if you had this kind of conversation. The constable probably would have locked that door or the president of the university would have thrown us all out and not allowed the speech to go on. Um, I think those are freedoms which we have won. And that's not something my country gave me, that some mystical entity called my country that gave me those freedoms. Those freedoms were won through democratic struggle, through agitation, through demonstration, through the right to have the vote. Women were never given the vote. Women had to fight for a hundred years and demonstrate, get garbage thrown at them and spit on and arrested and thrown into jail. Some of them died of pneumonia, force-fed in prison. They fought, they had to forcibly extract that democratic right. And labor was never given the right to collective bargaining, and working people were never given the right to vote. They had to fight for it and extract. And I think those things are terrific, and that's a part of America that we don't know enough about, that great democratic struggle. And that's gotta go on and continue and advance. So I don't have a totally negative view toward America. I have a totally negative view toward America only if you confuse America with Ronald Reagan, as he tries to do. Let me go on to the next person. There's a long line. I think we have to stop anyway. Can we, can we just say that nobody else has to Just wait a second. We'll just ask that nobody else join What's this? Okay. Well, I, I got lunch. Excuse me. What is it? Yeah. What is it? I can't eat that now. What is this? Oh, good. Um, why don't we just take, I know, I'm sorry, I hate to push you on, but if there's a long line, why don't we just take a couple more questions? Could I, could I ask people uh, to just sit down, because it's, um, it's now nine. Go ahead, why don't you make one more statement, since you seem determined not to leave. You were saying that when, when, when Gorbachev went to Geneva, that his intentions were entirely good, that he just wanted peace, he just wanted to get 
get away with all the props while Ronald Reagan was entirely evil motivated? What gives you the right to make this claim that looking at their actions, actions speak much clearer than words do? Right. And Gorbachev, and Gorbachev unilaterally has instituted a moratorium on nuclear weapons. Yeah, well, please finish and have some regard for people behind you in the hour, that's all. Sorry, I didn't mean to get... All right, you've made that point and you're repeating it. Could you stop now and let me answer it? Okay, I did not say that they're entirely good and entirely evil. I didn't use that kind of cartoon language. I said that Gorbachev seemed to sincerely put things on the table and show that he wanted to, that he wanted to negotiate these things and that actions indeed do speak louder than words. He has put a moratorium on nuclear testing. Now, both those political leaders know that when you stop testing, you stop the development of nuclear weapons. Both of them know that, and one of them is willing to take that step, and the other is not. That is indeed actions, and Reagan has taken an action also, and that action is not to stop testing, because he wants to continue that escalation, and that is indeed actions speaking louder than words. I'm sorry, I really have to ask you to sit down and let someone else speak. Damn, Perenny, Perenny getting his debate bro on in this video? Listen, you're in a lot oh, of time. Oh shit, let me fucking get that. <laughs> All right. What's up, everybody? What's Someone's going noticing on, new badges. Well, Salam, yeah, I see, uh, see a little bit of new artwork going on here. You guys, you guys picked up some hardware. <laughs> Everybody's got, uh, you know, a little bit of extra flair next to their names now that, like, we're slowly starting to learn how to use Twitch. <laughs> I love how just fucking fed up he looks. Yeah, right. I was about to say, I didn't even realize. I've never seen him really get that upset. I've never seen him upset, really. Even when he debated Hitchens, he never really got, like, that upset. And yeah. in this, like, I, I just tuned in. I wasn't really listening to the whole thing. Um, oh, wow. Uh, hey, what's up, Harley Ellis? Thank you so much. And um, it's a, it's very um, endearing to hear that we've been recommended by anybody. To anybody. <laughs> well, there's several things. One is the limits of... Let's get Pranny out of here. Let's get Pranny the fuck out of here. Let's get disgruntled Pranny. Let's get disgruntled Pranny off the screen. Um, Pranny was going debate, bro, with that guy. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love young Parenti. He's um, a lot like spicier, you know. He's got that uh, little bit of extra kick. Shout out to home. Sebs. Uh, <laughs> Sebs. <laughs> Shout out to Sebs. Yeah. Um, for helping a couple old boomers uh, acquire badge sizes um, while we were trying to rub sticks together to make fire, um, they grac graciously sized us up some badges so that everybody here can rock their new bling yes um they helped us with so much more i'm hoping that we're gonna look uh, a lot more streamlined we're gonna look just a lot big things better. coming yeah big things are big coming. Things coming and uh yes definitely give a round yeah, of applause to Sebs. Sebs. definitely give Sebs a follow right especially especially you know uh when they're uh streaming you know give them a give them a quick check out but uh, yeah, today's a big day. It's, it's, you know, all good things. Why is, come to why an is end. it a big day, Johnny? Tell us. Today is the is uh, the last day of uh, Michael Parenti's Black Shirts and Reds, Chapter Nine. Um, you know, I really feel like this book has been kind of like instrumental in us kind of finding our way a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, we The first book we read was was Inventing Reality. And I thought we were reading the entire book and just kind of yeah. doing like a little summary thing. That's insane. And like, <laughs> and like I had already read like the entire book um, the entire book. So then it was like, oh, let's go chapter by chapter. I was like, I'm not going back and like fine tooth combing each chapter. I just read the whole book and I did like a presentation on it. So then we moved to the divide and divide was really fun. Um, and you know, the counter rev, we ran into some muddy waters just in terms of the, um, presentation 
you know, the, the, how smooth the presentation was on that type of content. And then I feel like this one, this is really where we're kind of finding our operation a little bit. And I'm sad to see it's go to see it go, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about the horizons. Well, I, I think that like any like fresh, uh, like whatever you want to call yourself, a leftist communist, or just somebody like trying to figure shit out. I think that this book, you know, did that, you know, uh, for this stream in a lot of ways, um, in the but same way. Also, that, like, you know, this book is amazing, not just as the baby leftist that's getting into things and trying to maybe like flesh out some historical narratives or uh, Marxist, uh, you know, the qualities of Marxist uh, philosophy, but revisit this every few years yeah. because, uh, you know, me and Johnny have brought this up multiple times is that, you know, where we currently sta stand um i think there's fireworks going off outside because the eagles are going to the super bowl or something um but um you know read this every couple years because we've both said this multiple times that this has been like essentially reading a new book uh with with the set of eyes and the brain and the heart that we have now after being in this uh you know political realm a little bit longer reading more books understanding more things and it's very beneficial as someone who knows nothing but then if as you know more it becomes it enhances it differently let me shut my window because they're popping off fireworks. <laughs> There's sirens and fireworks outside. It's Philadelphia. It's another day. Could be it's another day in the city of brotherly love. <laughs> oh, now I heard him. I heard that one like very clearly. All right. Cool. How are you, Johnny? I'm doing all right. I can I can see you in like the the Twitch window, but I can't see you in the uh, Streamyard window. Why? And there's like a delay, so it's like it's uh, chat. Is everybody seeing me? Okay, no, I, I can see, dude. Everyone's gonna be able to see you. It's just you know, uh, it's gonna be a thing for like me and you. But it's all right. We've done it before. We'll make it work again. Okay, because you look perfect to me. Thank you. I try. I uh, you know I had a day at work, which is why I'm dressed nice not wearing you know some shitty band tee. right this is where um perenni takes a really hard and introspective turn towards uh yes. marketing strategy um and you know how to close opportunities how to bring up that uh that that closing ratio for your opportunities we always know we want to keep that that ratio at about one percent at about one percent you know if you get 100 calls you get 10 qualified opportunities you want to at least get a close out of one of those so here at subversive history we endorse uh keeping our closing ratio somewhere between the one and two percent mark um which all businesses strive for right you know this is uh not an anti-capitalist stream. <laughs> um, no, this is subversive history. This, is, this entire stream has merely been an experiment in ways that media companies can um, target leftist audiences. Yes. And, how, how can uh, we grift you? Yeah. <laughs> so subversive history is a multimedia community project seeking to bring attention to the revolutionary struggles of the world's often unsung and frequently misunderstood sectors. These are the stories of the demonized, vilified, whitewashed, or otherwise forgotten campaigns against imperialism, colonialism, capitalist exploitation, and racial apartheid. The orthodoxy of Western hegemony has often labeled these dissidents as subversive. And these are the struggles that we're going to illuminate on another episode of Subversive History. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Chapter um, nine fucking anything but class avoiding the c word and we're not talking about the aussie one we we all know and love that c word <laughs> um i should i should have done this better sorry this i you know sometimes my my google slide powerpoint skills are that of a sixth grader um maybe i'll mess with a new a new layout for the next book that we do on Wednesday. Um, more on that later. We'll probably, we'll probably discuss that. <laughs> that is correct. That is correct. Um, hey, good evening, Swen, Swenrich. I don't know if that's how you pronounce that. Swenrich. 
C word. I have so many in mind right now. The real C word is the friends we made along the way. See, if you were in the uh, Subversive History Discord, right, you would see that we have a PDF copy of Black Shirts and Reds. Or you would see that I'm lying right now, and you would figure out which one of us is the one that always tells the truth, and which one of us is always lying. Am I the truth teller? Only one way to find out. You have to get in the Discord, and you have to, you know... See, this like is how I insulate reading, myself. From, book. This, this is how I insulate myself from letting down our audience. Um, you know, I skirt every responsibility uh, outside of talking in front of this microphone. Yes. And, and then I can just um, feign, feign, you know, deny the, the, the uh, plausibility. Mm -hmm. All right. We've been joshing around here for a few minutes. Uh, what do you say we get into the content? Mm -hmm. All right, fine. <laughs> that's the uh, that's the motto. That's the motto of the subversive no. history. And uh, if you are ever like in another like you know lefty Twitch streamers chat, and you see subversive history uh, typing in all caps about something, making something incredibly inappropriate, it's me. It's not Pat. It's never Pat. Yeah, we should probably separate that somehow. I might. I don't know somehow. if that's the healthiest way to move forward with this but that's a discussion for another time um, <laughs> so today we are um going through the bittersweet conclusion of black shirts and reds the last chapter you know it's one thing that i kind of had an issue with this on there's no what? conclusive chapter where it's like we went through this ride and we went through all these topics and this this the c word is class uh, a spoiler alert right. that the word is class right um, and this is a class centered chapter, but it right. kind of ends on that note. And it doesn't really give, it doesn't weave everything together at the end in a nice, comfortable little package, which is nice for my sensibilities, um, which is fine. But I kind of would have liked a little bit of a, a little bit, a little bit of landing gear. If I mean, so like, to, so to speak, this is also the most um, like heavy in parenti citing parenti. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, is, which is great <laughs> yeah if you notice throughout perennies where i don't know if, to be honest it's been a while since i read democracy for the few or against empire which is two books that we'll undoubtedly do on this stream at, at some point um but obviously we don't want to you know just do perenny every other month um so we'll definitely do democracy for the few maybe in you know the next few months um but we want to make sure that we're giving like a, a diverse range of topics uh, historical political and otherwise so but you will see this when you're reading the books is that the and in the footnotes he'll be like hey if you want more information about this read my book uh, yeah Dirty right Truth. read my book read, read my article <laughs> read my uh, yeah so uh he does cite himself numerous times throughout this book um so moving into it, let's get into the chapter intro. Right. Um, class is a concept that is strenuously avoided by both mainstream writers and many on the left. When certain words are eliminated from public discourse, so are certain thoughts. Dissident ideas become all the more difficult to express when there are no words to express them. Class is usually dismissed as an outworn Marxist notion with no relevance to contemporary society. It is a five-letter word that is treated like a dirty four-letter word. I wonder which one he's talking about. <laughs> There's so many. Uh, I can think of three, four. <laughs> With the C word out of the way, it's an easy to dispose of. It's easy to dispose of other politically unacceptable concepts such as class privilege, class power, class exploitation, class interest, and class struggle. There are there, these two are judged no longer relevant, if ever they were, in a society that supposedly consists of fluid, pluralistic interplay of diverse groups. Um, so I can say pretty concretely that in all my years growing up, being through public school, educa public education systems of New Jersey, um, I don't think class was ever a very relevant um, topic of discussion um, I don't think I heard the no. term working class and still, until I started listening to like punk and oi when I was in like eighth grade, like that's when I started hearing more people say the working class, right. the working class, 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 class. Um, but I don't think school focused on that very much. Definitely not high school. Definitely not college. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I started ranting. I would say but, college like, more so because yeah. I've taken specific sociology classes um, where that's definitely referred to, but maybe in other, other topics, sure. Yeah, but like not in the way that like, you know, that we talk about it or in the way that like Parenti talks about it. Probably not. Probably not. Like in the sociology courses that I've been through, Mark, they, they offer lip service to Marx as a great, um, you know, thinker and, and, and one of the um, originators of what's called critical theory. Um, right. And they, this is where I learned some of the things about like, you know, um, social mobility or the lack thereof. See, now this is what I've noticed is that it, it kind of gets rebranded a lot as something called social mobility or socioeconomic status you might hear the word socioeconomic status as like a stand-in for class right um right so we're gonna get it get let perenny um get started a little bit here we have a couple videos and here's one um this is a video called how class works with a nice little animation by um everybody's favorite economics professor richard Dick the d wolf the heavy d wolf so uh johnny's eating right now so this will give us a nice little time for him to finish his chicken fucking general souls man the way class works in our society can best be understood if you think about how a business works in most businesses the people who do the work come five days a week use their brains and muscles doing what the employer sets them as tasks with the equipment and materials the employer provides. At the end of the day, they go home and the employer keeps the fruits of their labor, which the employer then sells. And the goal of the employer is to get more money when he sells the output than it costs him to buy the tools, equipment, raw material, and hire those workers. Class is this difference between those who do the work, the overwhelming majority, and those who gather the profit into their hands. The way our society splits up the output leaves those who get the profits in the position of deciding and figuring out what to do with them. And we all live with the results of what a really tiny minority in our society decide to do with the profits everybody produces. The profits in our society are huge. Uh, When you think about 500 to 1,000 large corporations in the United States do the overwhelming bulk of the business, you realize that into the boards of directors of these companies flows a huge part of what you might call the discretionary income in this society. If these profit-earning companies decide they can make more profit by adopting a technology which has the unfortunate result of polluting the air or the water, corporations will typically do that because the profit is more important to them than the social consequences that basically they don't have to live with and they don't have to pay for. And so you'll get decisions about how to use the profit, which is a social disaster in terms of the health, mental and physical of other people. Having a small group driven by profit, gathering into their hands the discretionary funds uh, shapes everything about the way we live. Class is one of the most repressed discourses in this country. Many Americans insist that we're all in the middle class, that if there are a handful of desperately poor people at one end and maybe a handful of desperately rich ones at the other, they're really a tiny footnote to a vast middle. This is a way of pretending that class differences, wealth, power, corporate structure, somehow aren't there or don't matter. They pretend that the issue isn't there or it doesn't matter or we all have it under control, none of which are true. The overwhelming majority of people have to go to work five days a week who live from the income that their work provides. And a very small minority have enough wealth to live off the wealth. The richest 10 or 20 percent of our country, which owns half the wealth, that's why they're the richest. They get rent on their land. They get interest on their money. They get all of these rewards, whether or not they do an an ounce of labor ever. Whereas the vast mass of people can only live by their labor. This is a fundamental inequality that infuses everything about our culture. The lip service as a nation we give to equality, to democracy, to equal opportunity are radically undone by the reality 
of the class structure. So class is going to force you into unpleasant recognitions and confrontations with a reality that has to be changed. Foreclosure in the United States today is in fact the perfect example. Over the last 30 years, uh, we have faced a phenomenon we never had before in the history of, of the United States. We have had uh, rising real wages in America, roughly from the beginning of our history. The zingers the keep coming. You work hard, Zing. You got more money in your wage envelope at the end of the week. It was true for 150 years, and that's really amazing, and no other country did that. It stopped in the 1970s because of computers replacing people, because of American companies moving abroad where they could pay lower wages, because of... A You're going to hear a lot about this as we go through this, as we look at studies, as we watch certain videos. Um, there was a big turning point on like class mobility or social mobility or socioeconomic mobility, however you want to refer to that, meaning the ability for one class generally the lower class to rise into like a middle or an upper class status and um the percentages of that drastically de decreasing in the 80s and um while there, this has always been an issue there was more of what's called like socioeconomic mobility up until the 80s um johnny's eating right now i would have asked him the rhetorical question of you know what happened in the 80s but i think we what happened um, in the 80s pat are you asking me through a mouth of General So Chicken what happened in the 80s? Maybe. Um, you know, obviously, for those of us that know recent American history, um, relatively recent, uh, this is when the Reaganite, there it is, Cinnamon Challenge said it right as I was saying it, Ronnie Reagan came in, um, birthed the uh, neoliberal socioeconomic polit political model um, which um, had a lot of anti-labor legislation, um, a lot of um, market liberalization, a move from like some of the more like um, Keynesian economic policies and um, ushered in a far more unequal society. Hey, you know um, that one season of The Wire where they follow the, uh, the doc union? Yeah, dude. Season two. Yeah. yeah. When, uh, when he says like, you know, we beat... <laughs> what did he call him like union busting ronnie <laughs> i was just watching the one episode you know where they have hamsterdam where they all yes sell drugs? oh my god so, so because they have hamsterdam where they're all allowed to sell drugs they don't need the lookouts or the runners anymore yeah. so they essentially all get laid off from the drug dealing business <laughs> and they don't have any any income so the cops go up and they're like well guess what because these kids don't have any money and they're out here doing all this crazy stuff because you technically laid them off. Now you got to give me a tax, a hundred dollars per dealer. And and they like redistribute and like the other cops, like, what are we communists now? Cause they're, like, <laughs> they're taxing all the drug dealers to redistribute the money, and, like buy like basketball hoops for the kids and shit like that. Because the, the employers ruthlessly cut them off. I um, wish the, the creator of that show wasn't so like ruthlessly lib. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really know much about the creators or anything like that. Don't, don't, don't investigate it. But uh, right. just, just one more um, fucking uh, uh, the D joke, and that is, uh, if you say you know co-op three times, uh, the D will creep. <laughs> the D will, the D will <laughs> find his way to you. If you say Mondragon in the mirror three times. <laughs> <laughs> a mass movement of women into the labor force, immigration, and we went from a country with a chronic labor shortage to a country with a chronic labor oversupply. Employers no longer had to raise wages to keep workers working, to keep them happy, to keep them employed. And as a result, the American working people went into a kind of prolonged psychic shock. Their wages weren't rising anymore. And so what they did was they turned to another source of money to realize the American dream that they had been culturally developed to hope for, to expect, to promise to their kids. They borrowed money like crazy. And the business community of the United States saw in the borrowing of the American working class a fantastic market to go after. You know, in the 1970s, at the beginning, the only people who had a credit card were wealthy people or folks on business expense accounts. Starting in the 1970s, we gave credit to the mass of Americans. Everybody gets a credit card, and everybody can go to the bank to borrow to buy a home. Mortgage debt, credit card debt explodes. 
it was a money-making extravaganza. We saw all the wealthy come together to get involved in this money, building houses, lending workers at huge interest rates, the money with which to buy the new and expensively built homes. Wealthy people poured their money in to companies that built these homes, furnished these homes, decorated these homes, and you have a literal explosion of profitability. But of course, you can't keep lending to working people if their underlying economic situation isn't improving. So it was only a matter of time until the extra. I feel like that's such like that single sentence is such like an important um, like description or like dynamic of our economic situation in the United States. Like, and I hate to use the term like late stage capitalism, but like when you're, um, I guess when your base, there's, there's like this this base situation where when you get kind of like past um, like a point of development, we're now like finance capital is becoming more and more important and you have all this lending happening. But then just like he's saying, you have the financial situation of like the individual workers or the people that are of like the working classes. Um, the, Ross Public had just said, said it when I was stumbling over my words, the consumer <laughs> credit filled the gap between wages and expenses. So it's like where wages have been um, stagnating and or even decreasing in some cases, you have consumer credit to like finance these uh, these commodities and keep the whole thing moving. But like you can only do this for so long. You can only lend to a base that can only consume so much before it fizzles out. borrowing reached the limit of the underlying frozen stagnant wages that was hit in 2007 millions of americans could no longer afford the houses that they had borrowed to buy and the foreclosure crisis represents the rage and anger of the wealthy class if the underlying people they lent money to can't pay for them they're going to take those houses back throw those people out of their homes and try to find another thank you for subscribing at tier one for three months vlad the victor of the profit motive vlad the victor thank you so much shout out um one of these days soon there would have been you know in, in this in a near future there'll be a nice little uh animation that will grace, of shit. that will that will grace the screen but unfortunately <laughs> uh, it is actually it's in the works at the moment and we weren't able to have it yet Creating Thank you, Vlad. a the housing best. boom that becomes a bust, and that now to recoup the money of the minority who invested in it requires millions of people, the majority, to literally lose their homes. Producing in the United States in 2010 and 2011, a society that has millions of empty homes side by side with millions of homeless people. Enormous pressure was placed on the United States government by big businesses, the businesses that produce homes, that clear land, that produce construction equipment, the businesses that produce the furniture that goes into the home. All of those companies have put enormous pressure on the government for the last hundred years to subsidize, to stimulate everything having to do with the home construction business. They yes, yes, Ross. Subsidize mortgages, which we've been doing. A lot of America. Adam Smith's it's writing is kind of based, to be honest. They wanted um, the government, even to Marx, help thought so in many respects. Homes because I think, I think, I think Adam Smith gets uh, re rebranded into something that on selling those is a little homes, bit of a aberration of his actual. And also, he, the there's homes, a difference between in terms of him so and Marx. Whole, one of them wrote prior to the Industrial Revolution, and the other one wrote living in the consequences of the industrial revolution so right. um you know if we if we if we lend any intellectual credit to adam smith then he may have had a very different idea of how to structure a market economy following the industrial revolution rather than his pre-industrial writings right corporate structure of the united states has been geared to make we'd be called landlords parasitic developing the private home business in the united states they are the ones who have made the major difference uh, in all of this.
every house virtually bought and sold in the United States over the last 25 years, with very few exceptions, was paid for with a mortgage loan. That is, the buyer of the home goes to typically a bank and borrows the money uh, with which to buy the house and then has to make a long-term repayment. Do you want to know who else also explains this, like, as a long- shockingly accurate? Who? Uh, do you remember the Chocolate Rain guy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he had, like, a whole song about this. Are you serious? I didn't know yeah. he had more than one song. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Hang on. All right, pull it up. Let's let this run out while you do that. Own, it has two sides, the borrower and the lender. In our kind of capitalist economy, it is the rule that a banker has the social responsibility of properly assessing risk. If billions upon billions of dollars were lent to people who couldn't pay it back, then the culpability is at least as much on the side of the bankers who made those loans as it is on the borrowers who took them out. Borrowing vast amounts of money to buy homes took off in the 1970s and 80s and 90s. It had not happened before. So if you're going to blame the victim, then something happened in 2009. (laughs) Just something that happened. Just then, and not, for example, in the previous 150 years. And now the most important point, which I made earlier. Starting in the 1970s, the American working class stopped getting real wage increases. So Yeah, literally. Fucking Tazon Day, the guy that's saying chocolate rain, because literally talks to. about this in because a song. Even though they became more and more productive for their employers, their employers did not raise their wages for the last 30 years. That's why they borrowed money, and that's why they borrowed too much money. And had the employers not taken advantage of the market to stop raising wages, had they simply continued to raise wages as American employers had been doing for the 150 years before the 1970s, there would not have been this explosion of borrowing, and there would not be the foreclosure prices now. So the blame for all of this is really not to be found with the individual borrower, or for that matter, even with the individual banker. We have a system that worked in such a way as to drive the masses of people to borrow what they shouldn't, and to drive the corporate sector to invest and lend in ways they shouldn't. The fault is in a system that makes people behave in ways they all come to regret. Capitalism here worked better than it did in other countries for a long time, and it accumulated a lot of wealth. Over the last 30 years, it hasn't raised the wages the way it had for 150 years before. The confrontation with the inability of capitalism to deliver the good Welcome was to Flashy Build Live. By having Americans work way more hours than other people in other countries, and by having American workers take on a level of debt no working class ever anywhere had ever seen before. <laughs> but we've now run out. We can't do more physical hours of work. And we this can't is a video called What is Class uh, by Richard Wolf. Borrow. And we're now going to, have to face it. Right. And I think so. Like this see video is helping to explain American a lot of like you know what this chapter, um, in Michael Parenti's Black Shirts and Reds, Chapter Nine, anything but class, uh, talks about. Discover class and realize class. That they have to question <laughs> a system that works this way. They're going to demand fundamental changes, and when they do, and as they do. They will rediscover the language of class, relearn it from the working people in other countries who never forgot it, and it will re-enter the discourse and debates of American society, uh, and probably with a vengeance. So uh, now we're going to take a little detour. Confused about the economy? Well, have no fear. I'm going to explain the American economy right now. Now, chat, judge which one's better. 
the promise from the government, but the value of the dollar has to be there to be relevant. The value of the dollar comes from China and Iran when they put the cash reserves in a U.S. dollar plan. They buy treasury bonds from the Federal Reserve. We say we owe you extra money because you gave us some of yours. That's a big part of the national debt. All the interest that we haven't paid in China quite yet. And a hundred other countries because we're such a good investment. The whole world gives us money. We say, hey, we'll pay you interest. This is how money is created from air. Bank bail our federal budget money isn't really there. It's an IOU. Remember, dollars are a promise. When you borrow from a bank and not from other deposits, the money for your loan gets created on the spot. Then they put it in your name, gamble on your life and body. But if you lose your job, then you were a bad bet. If a million lose your job, then we have a recession. Here's the dirty secret. Your labor's too expensive. Walks it once you're spending money, but they never want to pay you. And your life, cash, and credit, they are very different things. But you credit someone else's cash once it leaves your name. This is why money is debt, and your debt is good for Wall Street prosperity. And economic growth since the 1970s is consumers getting credit with our wages increasing. So when they talk about the housing crisis, they never say we need to lower housing prices. We need better devices to afford high prices, meaning higher debt, lower interest because you're underpaid to begin with. That's the cycle we're in. We don't understand. So all we can do is question mama. Economy make me understand all the numbers. Why daddy's on a welfare plan. Turning 30, 40, 50. Got a move in with my parents. And the stocks go up, but the jobs disappear. Yeah, mama, the economy make me understand all the numbers. Why daddy's on a welfare plan, turning 30, 40, 50. Gotta move in with my parents, and the stocks go up, but the jobs disappear. Because going on, P. Baking, uh, P. Baking, the cost of ownership. You can't it's afford it, so they make it to depend on in the small <clears throat> You're good, Sam. No worries. More for Pritterick than you do for gold, and more for bottled water than you do for oil. Razor blades are made to oxidate, so you're forever in debt to them just to shape. It's a type of socialism called market socialism. The best designed product makes you need and doesn't last. We subsidize waste with landfills and holidays like Earth Day teaching kids. Recycle, please. But kids don't learn in school. We live one worldview. Neoliberal economics and all of their politics. They don't ask why corporations are human citizens or our grandma pays more taxes because she lacks stock dividends or our private bankers print the public money or our democracy is broken because their leaders won't be cutting loopholes and subsidies for constituent industry putting legislative bodies in a deep freeze so the PhDs and the GEDs cry with Ayn Rand down at the temp agency saying we believed in meritocracy but there's more to the story and to me mama economy make me understand all the numbers why Daddy's on a welfare plan, turning 30, 40, 50, gotta move in with my parents and the stocks go up, but the jobs disappear, yeah, mama, economy make me understand all the numbers, why Daddy's on a welfare plan, turning 30, 40, 50, gotta move in with my parents and the stocks go up. Now, now tell me, chat, right? I want to see ones in chat for Richard Wolf, two for Tazon Day. Which one explained the economy better and more succinctly? Now, it's Tazon Day, Hashkush. This was written in fucking, like, 2011. No, oh, fucking damn it. All right, well, PBK, um, you'll just have to see it in the uh, in the YouTube, I guess. Are, were both of his wrists injured? Why was he wearing those two wrist guards? I don't know, man. Maybe he's just like a bad carpal tunnel. What's up, sir, for Mick Gritty? How are you? How you doing? I wonder if Mick Gritty is in, is in reference to Gritty uh the, <laughs> the the mascot for the for the philadelphia flyers as the philadelphia eagles are now going to the super bowl and there's fireworks going on outside my house <laughs> <laughs> all right now that we got a little lesson in class and economics by um uh the dueling videos of tazon day and um richard wolf oh get out of here 
Did I have two of those? What the hell? Okay, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. All right. So, yes, yes, I am. Um, all right. So now we're going to get into the denial of class, the first subchapter. Uh, according to Michael Perenni, those who occupy the higher circles of wealth and power are keenly aware of their own interests. While they sometimes seriously differ among themselves on specific issues, they exhibit an impressive cohesion when it comes to protecting the existing class system of corporate power, property, privilege, and profit. At the same time, they are careful to discourage public awareness of the class power they wield. They avoid the C word, especially when used in reference to themselves as in owning class, upper class, or moneyed class. And they like it least when the politically active elements of the owning class are called the ruling class. Now we have a couple other videos in store for you. That's going to talk about like media suppression of like class issues, as well as like a history of class struggle in the United States. I didn't want to front load the entire beginning of the stream with just a bunch of videos. So we're all just kind of like sitting here watching videos. I kind of peppered them through the presentation. So just going to be some like class relevant videos to break the monotony of reading, um, the, the book ex excerpts. So, um, so what we have here is um, basically our currency is fake. We credit the money from nothing through federal appropriations. Then we tax to manage inflation and sell bonds to lower interest rates. Oh, yeah, pretty much. Um, I think, what's his name? One Dime has like a pretty excellent video about like what happens with your federal taxes, right? And... Uh, when you give your taxes to to like the the federal government, you know, every year, uh, that money just gets deleted. Um, and I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna go into like you know uh, like an hour long video, right? But uh, yeah, it's it's pretty much just deleted. You can look it up um, on YouTube if you want, or I could just throw the link up. But uh, I think that like it, this is also one of uh, I think it's like the next paragraph after the one after that one that he oh. actually references his own work in this chapter. So we have self-reference one, right. In uh, like, you know, yet the ruling class members are far from invisible. Their command positions in the corporate world, their control of international finance and industry, their ownership of the major media and their influence over state power and the political process are all matters of public record to some limited degree. And in the footnote, it's for a more detailed treatment of ruling class resources and influence. See my democracy for the few sixth edition. Um, I have here just to kind of illustrate that point a little bit as well is a uh, excerpt from the guardian that says uh, the president, this is from when Trump was president. Uh, the president is the billionaire head of a global business empire. His cabinet is mostly millionaires. Most members of Congress are millionaires. Most Supreme court justices are millionaires. Millionaires make up less than 3% of the general public, but have unified major control, control of all three branches of federal government. Working class Americans, on the other hand, make up about half the country, but they never have held more than 2% of the seats in any Congress since the nation was founded. And this kind of goes back to um, last chapter, as well as this one. Um, um, what's it called? Um, kind of what, what was being referenced prior to um, in terms of analyzing these things like like these aren't the questions that are being asked by like non i guess class-minded individuals like why is the supreme court and all three um branches of the federal government um never has it never been more than two percent of like a working class represented uh, from a representative of the working class like e even then what like the the low-end college that they went to was like fucking harvard or something who was it i think it was uh our, 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 our BG or whatever, right? That like went to like a working class college. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this just does go to show that there is like a class concentration um, towards the upper end of our society in terms of our political apparatus and uh, how little that's really questioned. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even in like, I would even say that even during um, like the Occupy movement, when there was a lot of this like 99% or the 1%, I feel like there even wasn't a lot of discussion about how that 1% is also like concentrated throughout our entire government. So like I, I really became like a little bit more aware of this when I looked into Donald Trump's cabinet and it's like Goldman Sachs, Raytheon, 
Lockheed Martin, you know, previous CEOs of yeah. these major companies that are now just sitting in. And these are, these are companies that are getting federal contracts to, to create weapons and things like that. And they have them directly in the cabinets of the president. I mean, um, the, the worst part of all is that when I was describing, when I was describing Trump's cabinet there, that is not different than, uh, yeah. than other, I'm not trying to say that that was his cabinet exclusively. This is how Democrat Republican, this is just the nature of, uh, the, the constituency of the president. Yeah. I mean, you could argue that like Trump's was definitely like the most, um, like obvious, you know what I mean? Like they, I don't even, they weren't trying to be even, opaque about it, like at all. Right, I didn't but like Obama's didn't, whole what second yeah. cabinet was handpicked by Citibank. Right, right. Well, I wouldn't even say that it's less obvious. I just, I just think that Trump ended up spearheading it as like another titan of industry type of character. Where like this is the first time where they actually just directly elected a wealthy businessman to the presidency right. instead of pretty much having a spokesperson with connections to wealthy businessmen. Um, with a cabinet that is littered with wealthy businessmen as they tr channel like in and out of um, like, there's this ongoing relationship where if you're, where if you're in politics, when you retire from politics, you get a job at a bank or something like, or vice versa. If you have a job at a bank that you eventually like get involved in politics to some degree, there's this incestuous relationship between um, the business, the, the CEOs of major businesses and political like political support for political parties I'm trying to find that like flow chart of like politicians like former jobs or something like that where like it literally was like a chart showing you like you know where um like people end up either going into um business after being in like senate or congress or like yeah. you know politics in general and where they mm -hmm. come from and like most of them all have well, let's, like let's look at know, real quick let's look at what like joe biden's cabinet is i'm just curious <laughs> um, i i have not prepped this whatsoever so like how do i get to joe biden cabinet numbers so a lot of times that you'll have to do like a a side check on this because they generally don't say right on the, the white house website um so we got kamala anthony blinken Let's just check Anthony Blinken real quick. So Anthony Blinken. Uh, Blinken, after leaving government service, Blinken moved into the private sector, co-founding West Exec Advisors, uh, which is a consulting firm founded in 2017 by Anthony. Oh, is, is his name Anthony? Or is that a... Is that is is that a spelling issue? No, it's Anthony. There's no H in his name. Typical so of a so reptilian it's, alien. It's not Anthony? No, it's Anthony. Look, I mean, maybe you pronounce it like that, but if you look at it, it's... Huh. That's I'm still going to keep calling him Anthony Blinken. Right. Um, so look, so here's an example of this. So Anthony Blinken... Yes, it is a given that resources equal a red carpet into political power. But now, can we say is that there's massive conflicts conflicts of interest in it in this that materialize itself into like harming people of lower classes is the real is the real thing. It's it's not to question the logic of it. The logic of it is obvious. So, like for example, like let's look at Mark Esper. So this is where I would say. So if we're looking at Mark Esper, who was the United States Secretary of Defense, um, Esper lobbied for defense contractor Raytheon and its vice president of government relations. So this is where we kind of like when a government is offering federal contracts for weapons producers for wars that we're in, you can see like what could amount to a really sticky situation of conflict of interest between people that were working in these in industries and those who are leveraging contracts between them.
there is most likely a conflict of interest. What should we do? It's maybe certain legislation that prevents people from, uh, you know, that creates some kind of a divide between that. I mean, like, but here's the thing. You're never going to get rid of that conflict of interest because like, it's a conflict of interest for us, the people that like, you know, elect them. It's not a conflict of interest for them. Right. Right. Like people oftentimes try to act as if like there is some kind of like separate what? I think just as a matter of fact, it's a conflict of interest. It's just who does it harm? Who has the right. who has the most to lose because of the conflict of interest and the incestuous nature between these massive uh, business executives in Goldman Sachs, in Raytheon, and Lockheed Martin? Pretty much having just like an open door policy between um, the the powers of government and the private sector. I mean, y- yes, sir, from McGrady. That's pretty much like uh, hitting the, the the nail on the head. They're they're all pieces of shit, right? Um, but the thing is that like at the end of the day, right, they're not doing anything out of the ordinary. Like the whole country is founded on like this whole weird blending of the like, you know, federal government uh, basically renting out like its responsibilities to private contractors. Right. And we really see like the the ramping up of that. Um like, you know, I guess like in the nineties, right. You know, and into like, especially after nine 11, because like you had, uh, what's his name? Uh, rummy talking about right before nine 11, how we need to cut the fat, you know, we need to cut the military and we need to hire all these like private contractors to handle all these things. Where we had Wraithy. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, geez, Halliburton. Halliburton. Yes. Run by Dick Cheney, you know, and it's just been, you know, an endless stream of that that might be the most well known of this and i'm and um that might be the most well known of these situations because we've been talking about this since the early 2000s like halliburton's kind of a household name for kind of being like a very sketchy private entity that pretty much has massive sway with or had massive sway within the united states government and how that like maybe that that the interplay between those two things could be extremely problematic but just as i brought up with mark esper we're still doing the exact thing as recently as the trump presidency and i didn't even get into i haven't even gone through biden's cabinet with a fine tooth comb or anything like that to understand how these which which major players in the finance industry or the weapons contractor industry are still being at at that level there i found it Oh, you found the flow chart? Yeah. Oh, From we a flowing. New York Times article of all places. How every member got to Congress. Wait, is this, is it, suppo- what the hell? Yeah. Is this I know, it, looks, it looks weird. I know. <laughs> How am I supposed to make sense of that? <laughs> Is this a is this a joke? I thought my no. computer was, was like was like showing this. So it's it's private college, real estate, farming or ranching, state yeah. legislator to the I, house. I, yeah, yeah. I, right. I struggle with solutions that I'm satisfied with as well. I you know what I mean? Um, you know, there's only so much expertise I have in the field specifically. So I'm not here really offering, you know, I'm not sitting back here in my Twitch streamer scares chair and being like, let me tell you yeah. how everything needs to be done. I have the perfect solution for every problem that the United States government has. Look, um, I, would anybody telling you- in, I would say the first step in developing a solution is identifying the problems. And I think this is a significant yes. problem. We're, we're more about like identifying the problem. And obviously, you know, everybody here knows that there's a problem, right? But like, we're here to just try and educate people because like the number one thing that you're going to have told to you by like, you know, everybody that actually takes this shit seriously is you should probably read something, something. Yeah. You should probably read at least one thing, right? Like, and we're here to help you do that. We're here to help you get motivated to do that. We're more of a book club than like any kind of like uh, uh, a- a- advice channel or anything like that <laughs> about organizing or anything like that. I think what is like, this? What is this question? But shouldn't we be doing that? Is anyone doing what? Doing, reading? Yeah, doing. Yeah, this is a book. This is a book club stream. This is all. Yeah, based it literally on says book. book club in the description. Yeah. So, like, at no point have we ever made any kind of like you know what's the here's word? our plan for the economy. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> Like, um, we're, we're, we're not trying to like, you know, be like, uh, you, you need to do this and that, or you need to join this org or that one, 
you know, yeah. or we're here to talk shit about like this org or that org. I, I, I don't care which one you join. Like, what the fuck do we do? I'm not here to really direct anyone like what to do. Um, nor do I have a comfortable, uh, nor do I have a comfortable, comfortable answer for that. <laughs> Like I said, we're reading a book and we're going off from that. So these, these, these issues are being raised from the book and I'm reading this book and I'm doing some side research on it, but my, my primary, what is to be done? My primary, um, uh, research a good first comment. <laughs> was that the first comment of this person? Yeah, that was their first comment. <laughs> shout out, shout out to that. What is to be done? Um, so I don't want to get too off the rails here. Let's see what this has to say here, because this chart isn't doing much for me. I, I got to say that I'm really, um, um, I'm really upset about how they decided to put this on. So it here looks better when it's not like, you're not trying to show it on, on like a Twitch stream. I think like <laughs> here are the past that the members of the house of representatives took to Congress. Each line represents a Democrat or Republican representative and circles are the major educational career and edu and political milestones in their path to the house. Items are not exhaustive nor in chronological order. Uh, no, I know. I know. I know. Yeah, we knew right? it you're, you're good. Um, mm -hmm. so like you would think that like, Oh, there's education like that. That's a good thing. Right. And it's like, no, they started out private college, law school, private law, media, then education, then local government. And then to state legislature, like it, it's a, a lot of it is law school, law enforcement, business management, nonprofits, unions, fucking like, you know, sports law enforcement. I think this thing is like breaking my computer or like breaking this page. Like I, I can't like scroll like this, this like you, know, you can just, you can just go through representatives, you know, that, right. All the way over on like the left hand side where it oh, says find like representative. You can select individual ones if you want. And I think like if you just, you know, hit down on the, you know, arrow and then hit enter, it'll just take you to the next one. Down, enter, down, enter, down, enter. It's just not now it's completely frozen for me. My point is, right. Okay. What I was trying <laughs> to show with the fucking chart that I thought was very visually stimulating and, and mm -hmm. interesting was yeah. that like, very few of them is are, are like you know just strictly like you know law very few of them are like you know union organizing or like you know none of them are just like i worked in a fucking warehouse man you know yeah. or i flipped burgers at fucking like you know mickey d's or some shit it's all like you know media business management ngo like fucking education but i'm teaching law as an education like, so it's just like none of these are just normal people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I think we've pretty well established, at least just even from this quote and the data right here from this quote as well, the um, lack of mobility from the lower class into the political apparatus. I think we can all right. agree. That, like no, no one of the lower class is going into the the political class or or you like just look at. I'm sure I'm not the only person here, right? Um, that well, and I'm not, I didn't say like flipping burgers at McDonald's did, is like. A did you dish. flip burgers at McDonald's? Because when I worked at McDonald's, it's a machine that comes down and cooks them from the top and the bottom at the same time. There was actually no flipping of burgers. So it was, when like, I a, it was like a panini press. Exactly. It's kind of like a, so there's like the grill, just like a flat top grill, but then instead of having to do any flipping, there's just a, a, a top hot part that comes down on it. So, um, yeah, there, there's not much. <laughs> um, Whatever. But yeah, I worked at McDonald's when I was living, when I was in high school, my first job when I was like 16, it was very, it, it wasn't bad. I mean, I could pretty much smoke as much weed as I wanted to <laughs> I could eat as much Nick chicken nuggets as I wanted to, but in That's terms awesome. of like, you know, making money, um, you know, the, you know, but pretty much whether you work at McDonald's or wherever you make, what we're saying is that, you know, the bottom, the bottom of this, this class spectrum very rarely makes it into the political apparatus. So like, you know, my, my, I think that, you know what it's summed up, like, I really actually kind of liked his whole like credo response. Yeah. Thing. I have all that on here. Okay. Do you do, so, which one do you want to do? Do you want to read credo or response? This episode is made possible by audible. Um, the link below and get your do you want to get to that point or do you want to jump jump to it 
No, nah, all right. Whichever way you were planning on doing it, let's right. do it. To, go ahead, go ahead and read this part because we're going to go into the middle class now. All right, all right, all right, all right. The C word is an acceptable term when prefaced with the soothing adjective middle. Every politician, publicist, and pundit will rhapsodize about the middle class, the objective of their heartfelt concern. The much admired and much pitied middle class is supposedly inhabited by a virtuously self-sufficient people. Free from presumed uh, profligacy of those who inhabit the lower rungs of society by including almost everyone, quote, middle class, serves as a conveniently amorphous concept that masks the exploitation and inequality of social relations. It is a class label that denies the actuality of class power. The C word is allowable when applied to one other group, the desperate lot who live on the lowest rung of society, who get the least of everything while being regularly blamed for their own victimization. The underclass references to the presumed deficiencies of underclass people are acceptable because they reinforce the existing social hierarchy and justify the unjust treatment accorded society's most vulnerable elements and like tell me over the last like fucking 10 years at least that we haven't heard the middle class come up with every fucking political debate imaginable when it's not a real thing right right and that's i, I and i was going to say that before but i didn't want to jump too far ahead in the presentation because there's going to be a specific part of this where we look at middle class but <laughs> when i said that class was extremely um underrepresented in terms of at least what I was in my education growing up, there was no real discussion of class dynamics, class stratification, class power, class interest, or anything like this. Um, what is talked about a lot is the middle class and the middle class kind of like, um, Perenni said is like an amorphous, almost catch all. Have you ever seen the studies that talk about the disproportionate numbers on both ends of the poll that refer to themselves as middle class? Yeah. Meaning that there's the people that kind of do fall in the middle of the spectrum, but you can find a lot of people that are like living in poverty and people that are living in relative wealth that both right. will say like in almost a, like in a very erroneous way, um, um, I'm also middle class. I'm just a middle yeah, class. I mean, it's a, look, 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 we've talked about this and, and we've said this a number of times on stream, but like, you know. Pat, me and you, we obviously are doing like, you know, a little bit better than like the average person in our generation, right? Right, right, right. That doesn't mean that like if we lose our jobs, right, it's probably going to be about a month, maybe two, right? If we really dig deep, right, into like, you know, well, not that deep. I, I really don't have like a savings I can. Really, I don't really like, have much of a savings I, account. Me neither. So like, we'd probably be, be homeless like within a month. You know, and that's like if like unemployment, you know, actually like kicks in like, mm -hmm. you know, fast enough that like we'd maybe get another month. Right? And hopefully like no like car issues or um oh, fuck that. No, or, dude. Like, car issue or like a medical issue or one of my pets, something like right. that. Like hopefully nothing like that happens. Like right now I'm making enough money that all my uh bills can be paid and I do get a little bit of a get a little bit of luxury outside yeah. of that. But um, you know, that luxury is, you know within like a couple hundred dollars of like a special thing that I may want to get myself every month. Um, Where do you live, Ninja Can? <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to know where this good unemployment is. Is it like, ah, uh, okay. Quebecois. Quebecois. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't have that. Like there's actually an interesting, um, there's actually an interesting, uh, graph that showed social mobility. Um, I, let me see if I, if I have it here, because it's actually interesting that you bring up Canada because ca Canada, okay, here it is. Check this out. So, uh, and I want to go through this whole wiki page because it shows quite a bit, but, um, if you look here, here is, what? um, here what is, do you mean they paid you to get a diploma. Wow. That's awesome. What? So here's, um, intergenerational immobility which means that, like, <laughs> this rates on like the inequality index and like how mobile um so like right here intergenerational mobility versus economic equality 2012 countries close to the axis and the left bottom have the highest levels of socioeconomic equality and the social economic mobility so you see usa is up here in more of the unequal and less mobile area yeah. and then peru, peru is just out of 
and Chile, uh, you know what I mean? You can see um, quite a bit of, you know, Pinochet's policies coming. So what you're saying is Chile is, is doing better than um, Peru. Well, it depends because there's, there's like a left and a right access. No, I'm not saying the best are down here at the bottom. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Chile Paul, is, like, is Chile. doing, is doing better than Peru. So when you brought up <laughs> anime, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, so Canada is actually down here, right among like the the very best in terms of equality and social mobility. Where where social social um, equality and God, where income inequality and social mobility meet, um, Denmark is doing the best, but Finland, Norway, and Canada um, are right right alongside. So it doesn't surprise me to hear some of these better things about. Uh, Canada. So this is in 2012, a, gra a, a graph plotting the relationship between income inequality and interge intergenerational social mobility in the United States and 12 other developed countries dubbed the Great Gatsby Curve showed. Oh, oh fuck. Am I really? I yeah, you might want to just turn your speakers out a little bit. Um, is it, is it me? Am I the one echoing or is Pat the one echoing? I think it was more specific. No. Okay. okay. So the Great Gatsby curve showed a clear. Oh wow! Everybody's. I'm the one it echoing. My voice echo echoing through you because I heard myself echoing a little bit. Oh fuck! Do I got to turn down my volume? Because my own voice isn't coming through my speakers. Y'all are gonna make um, me fucking do it. Showed a clear negative relationship between inequality and social mobility. Countries with low levels of inequality, such as Denmark, Norway, and Finland, uh, they didn't shout out Canada there, but Canada, I think, deserves to be in that conversation, um, had some of the greatest mobility, while two countries with a high level of inequality, Chile and Brazil, had some of the lowest mobility. The curve was introduced in a speech by Chairman of the Council Economic Advisors, Alan Kruger, and the President's Economic Report to Congress. Um, okay, so just wanted to jump into that real quick. There's a lot that I want to... Um, no, none of us are wearing no. <laughs> Um, I'm not I'm not wearing headphones because it 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 I it's irritating. So um, just a little side tangent there on the way that because I want to go into a there's a really a lot of great data on that Wikipedia page that we're gonna get into, but um, a lot of statistics and things like that that are very interesting to dig into. So we read through all this. Do you want to get into this video? Yes. So just while and we're on the topic of um Have a good one, Ninja Can. Thanks for Have stopping by. This episode is made so, possible from by a good friend of the, the below. channel month, in spirit. Free. Second thought. While we're on the subject of, the of um, middle, class middle class. Has been ripped from their homes. In the middle class today are trying desperately uh, to survive. America's middle class is getting hollowed out. Joe Biden announced today a new front in his ongoing war against America's middle class. He's trying to tell us he cares about the middle class. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Pop quiz, Corn Pop. Yes. Are you middle class? Well, that depends, obviously. So many variables to take into account. Where do I even begin? Okay, for starters, are you a millionaire? Oh, good. Well, most millionaires are middle class, according to millionaires, so welcome to the club, I guess. Millionaires are the wealthiest 8% of the country, but sure, they can be part of the middle class. Plenty of room in the middle class for everybody. Come on in, the water's fine. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's right in the middle. Look, don't get mad, everybody's middle class anyway. All the way from the lowest income bracket to the highest in this Gallup poll, you'll find people who call themselves middle class, or if they're really brave, upper middle class welcome uh michael r hassler with no middle this is just how it is and it's been this way forever back in the late 30s nearly 90 percent of americans told the new york times they were middle class and only a measly six percent bravely donned the upper class label now don't worry we'll be putting all that to rest with a better definition of class later in this video but you'd be forgiven for getting confused what are millionaires doing in the same middle class that people making less than 20000 a year say they're part of? If being middle class is all about how much money you make, and yet this is how people self-identify. Oh, wait, what's that scene in um, middle class Animal House where the dude's talking all. about how, like, you know, uh, you know, my family used to be, like, you know, upper, lower, middle class, but <laughs> now we're, like, uh, upper, lower, middle class? <laughs> 
the class stratification. Yeah. Is it an actually useful phrase with any sort of analytical purpose, or just a cheap way to score easy political points, like supporting wildly unpopular policies, or shooting beer bottles some intern wrote socialism on? No, of course middle class means something. It's definitely 100% a real thing. Come on, if it didn't mean anything, who would care? Why would politicians spend so much time comforting the middle class and telling them they're going to be safe with them? Or if they don't vote right, that the other guy is going to screw them over? Why would the media regularly panic about the death of the middle class or about it getting hollowed out if it wasn't definitely real and also very important? <laughs> Listen up, bucko. The middle class is vital, okay? Middle, it's the middle, American middle. dream. Look, it says so right here in this Vox article about the middle class getting hollowed out. 40 years ago, the term middle class referred to Americans who had successfully obtained a version of the American dream, a steady income from one or two earners, a home, and security for the future. Now, it mostly means the ability to put your bills on auto pay and service debt. The stability that once characterized the middle I'm class- I'm really learning a lot means, here, like, or at least like a, like a dimension of this that I didn't really consider before about how debt plays into all this. Like, yeah. just like going off of um, what Richard Wolf said and now with this, and then also um, just even just some of the comments by like Ross about how like debt, like, like smooths over the cracks in the system where like, yeah, you're poor. Yeah. You can't afford all this consumer culture stuff, but here, if you just take out loans or you take out credit, now you can live more lavishly while still getting paid peanuts. Congratulations. Well, I mean, do, do you know what the other interesting thing about that is, right? That like, you know, yeah, yeah wages stopped rising in like the seventies. And then there's like the eighties where it's just like, oh, you can't afford all of these like, you know, uh, little doodads and, yeah. you know, all that shit. But then 89, right. Mm -hmm. Um, credit scores get implemented. Oh, I see. I see. Well, and this is also kind of the issue with the great depression. You know what I mean? Um, there was the issue with employers <laughs> charging as much as they could for consumer goods while also paying their employees as little as possible. Um, the stock market goes bunk and then everything comes crashing down into the, one of the worst, one of the worst depressions that the United States has ever seen. Um, and then Keynesianism is, is introduced where they right. say, listen, you have to pay them so they can buy things. That's how we keep this whole economy circulating. Then right. <laughs> right, and we kind of do the same thing where we um, um, allow more funds, you know, we, we Im implement trickle down. Right. And debt is a whole system. Think about all the jobs that wouldn't exist if people didn't take out debt to buy more goods and services. Yeah, yeah, there is, there, there definitely is a whole system, but yeah. it's like, is that, is that job sector hurt, harming, harmful or helpful? Oh, it's the uh, it's the fire um, finance fucking thing. What the fuck is it? It is. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, they have problems with that one. Wait, we had to pay the workers. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, God damn it. Acronym. How do you spell acronym again? It is the uh, Akron. No, that's not it. What the fuck? What were you saying? But it was like, you know, uh, financial. This says financial independence retire. That is definitely not it. God damn it. it but it's kind of like the Mickey Mike thing where it's just like our whole economy is like, you know, um, based around like debt, right? God damn it. Go ahead, look it up. Tell me when you have it. I'll put the video back on so we it don't have such a coveted and aspirational echelon of American existence has been hollowed out. There, not only is the middle class a real thing, a house with a white picket fence, a dog, and two and a half kids, all of that is not only real, it's under threat. We know this because the American dream isn't attainable anymore, and the only Found way it. to really experience it if you're not ludicrously wealthy is by getting into debt. Mortgages, credit cards, student loan debt. All right, so we've all heard of like the military industrial complex, right? But there's yeah. the fire, which refers to a sector of the economy composed of finance, insurance, and real estate, hence the acronym FIRE. Businesses that make up the fire economy include banks and credit unions, credit card companies, insurance agencies, mortgage brokers, investment brokerages, uh, real estate agencies, hedge funds, and more. So yeah, that's like a whole sector of the economy. So it's just like, you know, I know that a lot of people like to say that like, oh, America is just like, you know, 
three weapons manufacturers and a trench coat, you know, but like there's, there's more to it than that. You know, yeah. it's more than just prisons and, um, you know, weapons manufacturers and oil companies. There's also people that are just like blood sucking vampires that will bleed your family dry until you're homeless. <laughs> <In Ghana. laughs> Baldwin's ghost. Uh, good to see you, by the way. I didn't even know you were here. Uh, you ever see this video of David Harvey saying that part of the loan based home ownership push in the USA in the 60s and 70s was the idea that debt encumbered homeowners wouldn't go on strike? Exactly. Do you want to watch that or? Um, how long it's 11 is minutes. All right, well, we're in the middle of a video, so it wouldn't be smart yeah, to go. All right, so let's, video let's finish the video. Let's then. table that. I have the, the, the tab open. But also, just to speak about this more broadly, even at an international level, the Marshall Plan, like this ability to, um, for those of you that don't know, the Marshall Plan was the post-World War II economic package that the United States sent to war-torn Western Europe so that they could reinvigorate their infrastructures and their economies. But also, there was the hope that now there will be a like massive base of in an international community that will want to buy our it, it, that will want to engage with our consumer markets. I don't know if you've heard that um, that uh, yes that that part of that. Giannis Varoufakis talks uh, talks about that in a really interesting talk that he does. I think it's called, I forget what it's called. I'm sorry, I'm not even going to say. Needing to rent instead of owning your home for more of your 20s and 30s. Six of 10 Americans can't afford a surprise $500 expense. That's me. Average student loan debt is somewhere north of $35,000. Actually, taxes are about to come. Inflation my taxes are about to come in, so I can breathe high. for a second. But the I have American to dream over the is summer, so that's pretty over. much all my taxes. Go, you can kiss moving. the middle class goodbye. It makes sense. Or alternatively, if you're an economist or something, the middle class isn't going anywhere. Like a guy at a fish concert, the middle class goes with the flow. <laughs> According to economists, <laughs> finding the middle class is as easy as cutting up the population into five chunks and calling the middle three the middle class, or multiplying the median household income by, let's say, two-thirds and two. And all the numbers you get in between, well, that's the middle class. See, it's not going anywhere. Mathematically, there's always going to be a middle class, or rather a bunch of wildly different middle classes depending on who you ask. But what right. if the middle class never really existed in the first place? After all, we have so much trouble pinpointing exactly what it is and who belongs in it. When we do give a definition of the middle class, it's about vague things like the American dream or some arbitrary number we got by multiplying income by this or that fraction. And what about things like where you live? 50000 a year is a very different amount in San Francisco than it is in rural America. And is 50 k really the same if you make it by working 8 hours a day or just collecting returns on your investments, say if you're a landlord? Are two people with the same amount going into their bank accounts but living wildly different lives really part of the same class? It really well, yeah, seems like that's our current the, the class petrol is economy. Good oh, okay. So you're saying that job and is mostly just muddying the waters. Well, that's on purpose. The reality is that class isn't about how much money you make. It's about how you make your money. Do you make money by working for someone else or by profiting off the work of others? Don't worry, I'll explain exactly what I mean by that in two minutes and 22 seconds. Regardless of how you feel after hearing this definition of class divided in two, maybe for the first time, you have to recognize that it's just more useful than the current definition we hear our politicians use. Our current dominant definition sucks. You're telling me the best we can do is define class into three-ish groups of unknown size with undefined cutoffs, and everyone has a different idea of what the cutoff should be based on some random math, a fantasy from the 1950s, or the whims of a pollster. It sucks. Cutting up society in this crude, vague way isn't just impractical, it also ultimately tells us very little about society and gives us very little help in figuring out what we want it to look like. Are we okay with the lower class making 500 times less than the upper class? I don't know. Maybe. Is 500 a lot or a little? <laughs> Are we multiplying from the top of the lower class, the bottom, the very top of the upper class, or the middle of the middle class? Do we even objectively know what those numbers are in the first place? Or does it all depend on how big we make each group and where we draw the lines? The truth is, we don't have a clue. It's all random choices and opinions when you define class by income.
And at the end of the day, it's what allows one politician to say they're helping the middle class, while another says they're actually hurting it. They can be looking at the same numbers, but because we don't have any universal frame of reference for what the middle class is, they can technically both be right. One guy can say, this is what's happening to the middle class. And the other guy can say, malarkey, and then <laughs> nothing. We don't have a good way to even start agreeing malarkey. with facts, Malarxism. and therefore our politics go nowhere. Things uh, 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 malarkey Leninism. Know this. So what if we actually made an effort and used that second definition of class I talked about earlier? The advantage of dividing class along the lines of how you make your money instead of how much you make is that not only does it still give you an idea of the how much question, on top of that, you get a great insight into how the economy works, what your interests are, and therefore which politics. They said malarkey like 20 minutes ago. They're the ones who really fight for the middle class, and assuming whichever one you don't like is just lying, you will benefit from seeing class in this more practical way. Because right now, Liar. politicians and the people who finance their campaigns are the ones benefiting from the vague definition that keeps things the way they are, in their interest. And just so we're clear about how I'm defining class, here it is. Society is divided into two classes, not three, not four, not seven. On the one hand, there are those who need to work to live. And on the other, those who have the privilege to make other people work so they don't have to. So long as you exchange your mental or physical energy for a salary, you are part of the working class. The class of people that works. A term which I know is confusing because to most people, working class just means poor. But here, it literally means what it says, regardless of whether the work you do is white collar or blue collar. The remaining few who make most, if not the entirety of their money through rents, speculation, or profit, mainly by owning things like companies or housing, not through their own work, are called the capitalist class or the owner class. Yeah, it's but like, what's, oh, can I ask you? you if go you ahead, you go like first. a supervisor or a boss, that can fire you you're probably working class well can i ask you this because do does that simplistic of a dichotomy between the working class and the capitalist class kind of leave out little room for like criticism of like the ceo class um where someone may not technically own anything and are technically a laboring employee of a massive company but at the same time they may be making hundreds of times more than somebody that might own a coffee shop like because i think it's like let me ask I think you it, this let me ask you this um if the CEO stops working, right, d does does something continue to get produced? Yes. What? What do you mean? If they stop working, does something can? Does like something... if if the CEO stops working, right? Yeah, if you're a CEO of Apple, if okay. the CEO is gone, the apples are still getting. The, the apples <laughs> the, the apples are still getting made by apple right that's what they the make apples, right the apples are still being grown um what the fuck is it no well, like i guess like in a more like technical uh, to to break down that analogy a little bit more right if the worker stops working things of value stop getting produced if the ceo stops working right, right and like let's just say they they fire the ceo right right um and they don't ever replace him the, the the workers will probably still continue i to agree work. i'm asking if the dichotomy that's played out in front of us in this that there is a working class that sells their labor for a wage and does not yes. technically own anything is a working class person that means that we have to admit that like a ceo that person mark esper that we were just looking at is yeah. while not an owner is like a vice president um you know, I think there needs to be a little bit further of a distinction because obviously in Marx's time, this type of situation did not necessarily exist. Oh, there um, are. There, there have been. Right. There have been what? Distinctions made. Yeah, there's plenty of It seems like in been. this video, I'm saying what's being played out right in front of me. It seems like, I think it is valuable to kind of move like some of the muddiness out of the way of like upper middle and um, lower class. But um, I think breaking it down purely into like, the proletariat and the capitalist okay. is See, also a little bit there's a lot of of muddiness there as well so here's the thing about jt right jt is making videos for people that like you know um don't know fucking anything right but i'm just right? like as, so if you're a marxist and you step into a conversation and you haven't like or you claim to be a marxist and you step into the con conversation um okay yeah right exactly it's left it, one of them. yeah 
perfectly. Like, you know, he, he's not going to go into like, you know, the, the stratification of class. Well, you know and I could I mean? put this to you the other way, right? Say there's a small business owner that, you know, at a coffee shop. And if they are fired or if they lose their position at that for one reason or another, the coffee does not get produced because they play like a very like centrally integral role in the process, despite being the owner. You know what I mean? I mean? Yeah. If, if they are the, like, like, you know, making the coffee like smaller, and shit, smaller, smaller non franchise businesses that are owned by people that work there on the day to day. Yeah, I'm sure they, they did. I'm, you know, I'm sure they do. I'm not like trying to use this as just like the ultimate, like everything that he believes and condemn condemn him to one like area of belief. I'm just saying, for this discussion, I feel like if we if we subscribe to Marxism and Marxism in the 20, 21st century, we have to like kind of know how to navigate through these distinctions when we make economic suggestions. I fucking love Amilcar Cabral, um, and I hope one day that we read some of his work. Who is um, that? I've never even heard of that. For real, Cape Verde, um, uh, like revolutionary. Oh wow! Yeah, he's like hey, the guy up? that um, or kind it? of like kicked off a lot of like you know uh, Pan Africanist, um, you know like. What year? What year? Let me look this up. What year was this for? Oh. I want to say like the early '60s or the '50s. Also, correct okay. me if I'm wrong on Cape Verde. Um, oh yeah, well, yeah, somehow that Guinea oh, Bissau, Guinea -Bissau. Yeah, 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 Cape Verdean, yeah, well, both, yeah. Um, wow, this is pretty cool. Oh, yeah, I've never no, even he's, heard of any of the work of this individual. He's really cool. I think he's that, really like, cool. you know, we should definitely check out his stuff. Fuck Yeah, yeah, if you like, like, Che Guevara and shit, you will love Amilcar Cabral. How did he die? Oh, he's <laughs> <laughs> same way. Oh, there he is with with Fidel. Yeah, uh, Fidel. Yeah. How, how did he die? How do you think? How do you think he died? I'll give you three guesses. <laughs> you can only use one. All right. Um. Very but yeah, no, I look, I have plenty of criticisms of JT that like will probably prevent him from ever coming on our show, which is sad, but like, you know, um, like w one of them is that like, this is very like one Oh one type shit. This, this is also absolutely true. What Sebs brings up here is that even in that case, that there is this business owner right. that is like, you know, essential to selling the coffee at that specific establishment. Who's growing the coffee? Right. And then you go to the imperialism and the term that for the working class of the imperial core. Oh, what is the term for the working class of the imperial imperial core? Um oh fuck. That's the, um that's that fucking settlers bullshit. The um hierarchy something or what the fuck is it called? Oh, fucking god damn it. I'm not sure. Um Look that up. I'll be playing this. Let's labor start aristocracy. With the it would be like the opposite of the labor aristocracy. Um, no, no, that like, isn't labor aristocracy. That's it. The labor aristocracy is is what? Isn't that the term like labor aristocracy? Well, the labor aristocracy, I believe, is the like petty bourgeois, right? It is that. Oh, okay. Yeah, labor aristocracy. But I thought the labor aristocracy was the upper. Clap upper part of the labor, labor aristocracy. I think it's just the term for that there is an aristocracy within the proletariat. Yeah, but I'm saying that then there's the underclass. I thought he was asking, <laughs> they were asking specifically what the underclass of that was. That's why we might need to read settlers at some point. I mean, we should read settlers at some point, but yeah. But I'm saying the arist if you're part of the aristocracy, that means that you're kind of part of the is it the lumpen proletariat? Lumpen proletariat is where you're like labor. It's kind of like criminals and stuff where your, your labor doesn't really like, you know, um, like you don't sell your weight, your labor for a wage, but you're also not a capitalist. If that Unorganized makes sense. and unpolitical lower orders of society who are not interested in revolutionary advancement. Yeah. A demoralized worker. Yeah, that's good. Let's not get too far off the rails here. Let's no, let we're, all... we're, we're heading into the weeds. So it's... Class is about I'm having fun, you make, <laughs> not how you make it. As we've already seen, the first advantage of the vague definition is that it makes things, well, vague. 
we don't really know what's going on, and it's basically impossible to assess what politicians say objectively. But there's more. The vague definition is constantly used to throw the middle class into competition with the so-called lower class. In other words, according to our better definition, two people who are both part of the working class are pitted against each other. Politicians constantly invoke the middle class because you'll always be able to find someone with more money than you and someone with less money than you. So it'll always feel like they're talking to you. And in that process, they warn you against the people below you in the hierarchy. The lower class are the people who make less money than you. You know, this is also like a really interesting dynamic. Like, let's say that you own stock in a company that you are an employee of or you can be fired of at any time and say you own a sizable portion of it. Where do you fall in this dichotomy? Well, it's just like, are you directing like, you know, what the company does? No, but no, but that wasn't part of the dichotomy posed in the video. It was just, it was broken down to merely, do you sell your labor? Which this person might do, but they also might own a considerable amount of stock. So if you own a considerable amount of stock, do you hold sway over the direction of the, like, I would production? say whether directly or indirectly, you know I mean? yes. Like, if you don't dictate, like, the, the means, right, of production, right? Like, if you don't have a key, right, to the factory, so to speak, um, like, you're, you're not a capitalist. You can have yeah, all the stock you want. Just re rereading PVK's comment here, they might not even be referring to owning stock in, like in the company. Like maybe there's not stock trading within the company internally, like a co like a company like Publix does. But I maybe what they're referring to is that in this situation, so you work for a place, but also you have a sizable investment portfolio, and it could be just any. You could invest in whatever. I guess it doesn't even have to be the company that you're working in. Um, would you simultaneously be part? I mean, I guess you we could say here pretty confidently that being part of the owning class kind of supersedes the, 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 like, you know, if you own and make a lot of money from your investments or ownerships, but then you also like for your own, like feel goods decide to go and get a job somewhere for some moral reason, maybe, or for some recreate, almost like a recreational, like my grandmother, for example, didn't need like a lot of money because of my grandfather's pension from working in the union, but she did it because it was like, I want to get out of the house more. You know what I mean? Not saying that those two things exactly, but like that kind of job pursuit. Yeah, these are like a lot of like little nitty gritty details. You know what I mean? Which is why there's like, yes, there are people ha have broken down this into like all of its like uh, various forms, right? Yeah. Um, there are people that have like created like, you know, words to describe these things. But yeah. it's like at the end of the day, for the most part, right? A capitalist is someone who dictates like the means of production to someone who does the labor to produce the commodity well, of value. I don't think they even have to dictate. They just have to own. They don't, they, they can hire right. people to dictate everything. I think what it really comes down to is that you are just making your money off of simply owning. You are not contributing right. anything else to the process. And this can happen in varying degrees and things like that. But I'm saying there is absolutely an owning class of people that says, I have the capital. I now own this. Everyone else is going to do this. I will have no hand in the production or even the management. I will just own. I mean, this is also why there's like heterodox economists and shit that still get into fucking debates over this bullshit. And there's like a bunch of people. I mean, like the, that's what basically what the chapter is about is that you have like, you know, a fucking uh, century and a half of people that like, you know, have uh, 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 zeroed in on every little fucking minutia of this argument, you know, either in favor or against right and like uh creating like an entire field out of examining these uh tiny little differences within like uh this uh the system of capitalist proletariat if that makes right. any sense right i, I don't want to get to, I, I, i'm not, we'll, we'll continue with the video right and therefore that you are told are out there gunning for your job or taking your tax dollars for welfare and whatnot you are constantly pitted against people who are worse off than you. And if that feels weird, it's because at the end of the day, you actually share the same interests. You're both trying to get by and live a decent life. Just like there's no middle class, there's no such thing as the lower class. You're on the same team. The only thing that sets you apart is how precarious your situation is right this second. Not the incentives you're responding to and where you could be if the circumstances were slightly different. 
as a member of the so-called middle class, you're always told to fear, if not outright despise, the lower class. But they're not a threat to your guarantee of a decent life. It's the capitalists above you who enjoy a net benefit from working class infighting. Infighting not only pushes things like wages down, therefore increasing their profits, it also distracts from the fact that they are profiting in the first place, meaning their position at the top of society doesn't get challenged. This can get confusing, like wandering into a fish concert. Oftentimes, people get a bit confused with all this because they won't feel like they exactly fit into oh. the definitions I've given so far. Usually it's because calling yourself working class feels wrong after years of being told it means poor, especially if you now live a comfortable life working a white-collar job. But most often, the confusion arises among small business owners, people who don't seem to fit in because they ostensibly own a company but still have to work together. Wow, uh, little did I know that this was going to be covered. I didn't actually even watch this video before I put it on. I probably watched it about six months or a year ago when it first came out. Mm -hmm. But um, I had a feeling that it would be pretty insightful to what we're talking about. And I was kind of threw this in in the last minute. But all these things that we're arguing about, it seems like they're bringing up right now. To get by and live a comfortable life. What side of the divide do you end up on if this is you? It's easy to imagine a day where your company will grow and you'll need to employ more people and eventually you won't need to work anymore. That you'll become a capitalist and will be able to earn a living even this after you stop woke working. COVID it's the vision fucking of fucking B-roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, can I purchase some woke COVID B-roll, please? Uh, yeah, three. Yeah, let me get two whites and an Asian guy um, working at a coffee shop. That would be that would one be of them perfect. needs to be a woman, though. One of them. <laughs> Give the guy a haircut that is very indicative of progressivism. Thank yeah, you. Make make the older white guy with uh, the, the the haircut. Like I need him. I need to make sure he looks like he's the boss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but a pro progressive boss. He's the nice guy, but he's yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah, he's, you know what? He, him and his husband friend. started this out of the kindness of their heart, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they buy fair trade beans. The American dream is built on. If this is you, it's easy to see how you'll start identifying with the capitalist class that you hope to join one day, rather than the working class you share a lot. Oh, I think more. that's actually a. I think this is actually a picture of Panama City. I think Whoa. that's actually Panama City, Panama. Today, it's that famous Steinbeck misquote that the poor see themselves not as an exploited proletariat, but as temporarily <laughs> embarrassed millionaires. But if you're a small business owner, some part of you intuitively knows what side will actually defend your interests, even though it's not always obvious. Deep in your heart, you know it's not the capitalists. You've heard of stores like Walmart <laughs> coming into cities and towns like yours and driving people who do the same things as you out of business. I want to finish this video. We'll finish the video. I have I have a Black Lives Matter thing that I wanted to bring up, but I think there's another okay. more appropriate time Big for me to do that. I, I have some stories to tell about that ones. shit. If you're a small business entrepreneur in tech, this kind of stuff might even be built into your business plan, getting bought out by a bigger company like Facebook or Google, right even though you know that it's ultimately bad for society to have monopolies like this. But you still do it because it's the rules of the game. And if you don't sell out early, you'll probably just get driven out eventually. Nobody really stands up to the giants, at least not for long. Small business owners constantly have to hold competing narratives in their heads. One, that they're going to be taken over. But not all of those athletes make 300K two, plus. They will be one of the lucky few that becomes the bigger company. There is no alternative. There is no situation in a capitalist economy where businesses of all sizes cohabitate and don't try to encroach on each other's territory. The goal is always growth. And those who don't subscribe to that mentality don't make it very long. 20% of small businesses fail after a year. Half are gone after five and only 30% make it past a decade. Say what you want about the reasons these businesses fail. The ultimate truth is that the system point, is not built skeleton. for small businesses. To continue. And that's who he's making these videos for. Why would we be turned off by the video? But, uh, just because like, you know, we get into like a long, like, you know, debate about like, but what if you own this or yeah. that? Or like, what if like this scenario, you know what I mean? 
maybe if you just never considered it in this way before, this would be helpful in progressing you yes. towards something a little bit more class conscious or a little bit more or less like completely stuck into the binary or not necessarily a binary, but, but completely entrapped in the, in the dynamic that is expressed right. by like liberal capitalism. Right. The, the average person has no fucking idea who like a- Amilcar C- Cabral is, or have even heard the book settlers. Right. Yeah. You know, and, um, but before you you get into your story about Black Lives Matter, right? Like, um, I was during the pandemic working right as like an electrician's assistant, and um, like I used to love checking out the books that were in people's homes. You see a lot of bookshelves in uh, liberal homes when you're installing like thousand dollar light fixtures while people are like struggling to. Uh, you know, make ends meet during the middle of a pandemic and everyone's unemployed except for these people that just sit in front of a computer all day. And the irony is not lost on me, you know, as we make this. Um, But I cannot tell you how many homes I saw with like the hate has no home here sign, right? And have like a bunch of like, you know, um, how to streamline, you know, your productivity, like, you know, how to be like the, the, the best, like go getter, like fucking bullshit. And then randomly in the middle of the bookshelf is like a copy of Mein Kampf. And I'm just like, I, it's just staring at me. Like it's staring back at me. And I'm just like, that's it. As far as like political books, maybe there's like, you know, an Obama autobiography or like, you know, Bill Clinton autobiography on there too. But like, fucking right next to it is mind comp and i'm just like why do you have that like (laughs) (laughs) we woo we woo we woo what the fuck is that (laughs) continue to identify with the people who it is built for is to bet a lot on the system that will happily chew you up and spit you out in other words the real threat is not from below it's from above So if you're a small business owner and you make the majority of your money through your own work, you're not a temporarily embarrassed millionaire. You are a member of the working class. That's all there is to it. This system is not built for you. And the odds you make it to the upper strata of society for whom it is built are insanely low. The capitalist class, by virtue of the incentives it's responding to, the main one being profitability, will always inevitably consolidate into monopolies at the expense of everyone else. Some While Eckhart Tolle power of now shit. Product, no, no, no. 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 There, there was never any of that. Or an outright monopoly, like we see in our media, consumer goods, and food and beverage markets, even that positive outcome gets thrown out the window. Just look at Uber and Lyft no, raising uh, their rates. No, my boss was not taken over the market. Going into those houses, level, that was that was not the clientele he was attracting. Than billions of people combined. The problem is that if you're constantly focused on protecting yourself from the so-called lower class, it's easy to ignore this going on in the background. By naming terms directly and stating things as they are, not as we imagine them to be, it's easy to see that we all have an interest in stopping this from happening. But so long as there is rampant working class infighting, that won't be possible. Stop calling yourself middle class. It clearly doesn't mean anything, and it's not doing anything except hurting you in the long run. The good thing is that now that you have a stronger, more useful definition of class, you can understand politicians a lot better. When you hear a politician tell you that their policies are going to help the middle class, and they give you numbers like how many jobs are going to be created, or how much money you'll save on taxes, or whatever, Look past the carefully written speeches and think to yourself, does this policy help me as a worker, or is it going to end up giving more power to my boss? Put yourself in your boss's shoes, and if this seems like something he'd be into, you know it's something you're not going to enjoy. If you're a worker, someone waiting for employment, or someone who depends on workers' wages, like if you're not of working age or you're a stay-at-home spouse, for example, in other words, working class, I guarantee this is going to make politics not only more digestible, but a lot more transparent. Stop believing these white picket fence lies. This is one of those topics that's super important, but rarely gets explained all that well. I try my best to learn and understand as much as I can so I can share with others. And one way I like to do that is by listening to audiobooks. No. All right, that's that's enough. Get out of here. Get out of here. That's enough. I see the building enough. This episode is made possible <laughs> by Audible. Follow all right so like what the fuck is it like um 
I, I I think that was like a good like 101 video if like you've like if you're not in this chat it seems <laughs> like if... well i mean i figure that we have to cater to this to people the, the that wouldn't know about it maybe yeah for I mean? for like, the silent like, chatter you know the... what is class on yeah. it wasn't meant to be like a highbrow it was meant to be um <laughs> <laughs> um so we can get into this little class credo response situation here um right, who do you want to be want credo or response whichever you want man you can you can you can take the lead on this all right i'll, I'll do response you do credo okay. so class reality Class reality is obscured by an ideology whose tenets might be summarized and rebutted as follows. <clears throat> so I'll be credo, right? There are no real class divisions in the society. Save some, save for some rich and poor. Almost all of us are middle class. I think I'm channeling Hunter Avalon. I think I'm just like <laughs> I think I've just become a Hunter Avalon as I as I read this. So if you hear me reading this, I'm just going to essentially be Hunter Avalon reading this. Wealth is an enormously concentrated in the hands of relatively few in this country. While tens of millions work for poverty level wages, when work is to be had, the gap between rich and poor has always been great and has, al has been growing since the late 1970s. Those in the middle class also have been enduring increasing economic injustice and insecurity. But if you can't trust the CIA, then who can you trust? <laughs> If I can't, if I can't trust media made by you know and signed off by millionaires, who can I trust? <laughs> Our social institutions and culture are autonomous entities in a pluralistic society, largely free of the influences of wealth and class power. To think otherwise is to entertain conspiracy theories. Great concentrations of wealth exercise an influence in all aspects of life, often a dominating one. Our social and cultural institutions are run by boards of directors or trustees or regents drawn largely from interlocking, non-elective, self-electing corporate elites. They and their faithful hirelings occupy most of the command positions of the executive state and other policymaking bodies and manifest a keen awareness of their class interests when shaping domestic and international policies. This includes such policies as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, if you remember, if I had a copy of, fuck, just imagine this is the divide, tap, 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 tap. The divide, we went over what the gap was, the general and agreement on terrorism. And NAFTA, trade. right? Yes. The gap um, was a precursor to NAFTA. Designed to circumvent whatever democratic sovereignty exists within nations. Just because I profited off of anti-transphobic -tran videos for most of my YouTube career, that doesn't mean I can't be progressive now. Sorry. So, do you hear about the rumors that Stephen Crowder might be bi? Yeah, yeah. Like he, he talks about the gay demons in his head or something. I, 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 I really, I fucking, I kind of hope he is. Yeah. I, I hope, I hope there's a redemption arc for Stephen Crowder. And I know Chat is probably going to disagree with me, but I really do or think he, a, a redemption arc where he just like burns down the Daily Wire and then just becomes like a like outright proponent for <laughs> i hope he becomes like he's so bi. the most fierce drag queen since rupaul <laughs> Sebs, i knew i could fix him <laughs> Dude, we have one of the funniest chats like, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't engage with a lot of chats but i laugh so often from the shit these people <laughs> <laughs> i mean think about it like you know it. he's never gonna get another like right-wing deal from any of those companies ever again it only yeah. makes sense for him come to just, out, just come out and burn it all down and yeah come to, the, come to the, the the dark side just spill all the tea just spill yeah. all the tea on all of your former friends because like none of them are ever going to fuck with you ever again. Yeah. So it's like you might as well just like, you know, fucking like, you know, just do it. Come on. Know, bro. Be you. Just be you. 
we're not going to hate you for wearing a dress. And and you don't even have to come up with like well, an occasion to record, wear one. He's already worn a dress like a hundred times. He does not miss a chance to wear a yeah. dress. Like yeah. he's like, <laughs> yeah, he pretty much just wore dresses regularly throughout it. I mean, like, look, 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 look. Um, RuPaul already has like uh, a bunch of like stocks or something, or like owns a fracking company. So like, it really would be that big me? of a fucking difference. What? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you at all. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, okay. That's like liberalism in a fucking in a fucking nutshell. Yeah. It's like you know, just just stream for diversity and progressive programming, but it's okay if they own fra if they're fracking billionaires. Yes. Like we we support fracking billionaires as long as um they're they're drag queens. Yes. Thank you, Sebs, for for speaking up. Um. Yes. <laughs> RuPaul's problematic as fuck, and I'm tired of fucking like mostly white gay men. Like you know giving me like a, a fucking weird look when they're like, you know, like, what do you mean you don't want drag race? I'm like, I don't like RuPaul. Like as a person, I think he's shitty. I don't really know enough about all that, but I'm going to take your word for it. You should. I do. I, I do. And Sebs between you and Sebs, I, I, <laughs> I'm very comfortable in, in, in taking that. <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean oh, you don't listen to Beyonce? What do you mean you don't like RuPaul? It's like, what are you, right? No, it's not. It's nothing to do with that. They're just like rich, out of touch billionaires. Pat the token straight. He is. I agree. <laughs> That's how I feel as well. I don't need to hear. I don't need to hear anything else. All right. So let's get back to the credo. The differences between rich and poor are a natural given, not causally linked. Individual human behavior, not class, determines human performance and life chances. Existing social arrangement, arrangements are a natural reflection of largely innate human proclivities. All conservative ideologies justify existing any inequities as a natural order of things, inevitable outcomes of human nature. If the very rich are naturally so much more capable than the rest of us, why must they be provided with so many artificial privileges under the law, so many bailouts, subsidies, and other special considerations at our expense? Their naturally superior talents include unprincipled and illegal subterfuges such as price fixing stock manipulation, insider trading, fraud, tax evasion, the legal enforcement of unfair competition, ecological spoilation, harmful products, and unsafe work conditions. One might expect naturally superior people not to act in such rapacious and venal ways. Differences in talent and capacity, as might exist between individuals, do not excuse the crimes and injustices that are endemic to the corporate business system. Yeah. Um, don't forget public research of their private products. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like the other thing is that like almost every major advancement in terms of like c commodities and shit like that, they're yeah. all done at the public dime, but right. then capitalized on by private entities. I try my best to do some like, I, I try my best, like while I'm caught up, like really in school and doing this the stream where I have to read a book for that. I try to like force myself to at least read 10 pages of a recreational book. So, cause I've already read black shirts and red. So it's like, if I'm not getting to the new books on my bookshelf, I feel bad. So I try to first thing before I get on any schoolwork or work for the stream, make sure you read 10 pages of, of one of your recreational books. So I right now I'm about to finish one book, but uh, this is the next one I'm starting entrepreneurial state um, where it says uh, debunking public versus private sector myths. And, um, in this sharp and controversial book, Mariana Mazzucato debunks the pervasive myth that the state is the is that the state is a laggard bureaucratic apparatus at odds with dynamic private private sector. She reveals a detailed case studies, including a riveting chapter on the iPhone, that the opposite is true. The state is and has been our boldest and most valuable innovator. Denying this history is leading us down the wrong path. A select few get credit for what is an intensely collective effort, and the U.S. government has started. Disinvent, disinv disinvesting from innovation. The repercussions could stunt economic growth and increase inequality. <laughs> exactly, said Chow. I hate him. I hate his ability to read the way he does. I fucking hate his like dedication. I like resent him for it. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, like uh, PKV to an- to answer that, it's just kind of like also, isn't it sort of reliant on like is yeah. the U.S. dollar still like the hegemony? You well, know, here's, here's something important to put. I'm sure that somebody in chat will pull this up, but like Johnny, just before anybody else can answer it, do you know how much? This was in like 2006, 17 or 18 or something like that. But um, do you know how much you have to make to be in the 1% top earning percentile of this country? I, th- I, I, I think it's it's got to be like over 100 million, right? Dude, it's like $400,000. What? Yeah. Yeah, 400000 Look, here, I'll show you. You have to make to be in the top one percent right now okay so it's gone up but um the more recent study it's five hundred and ninety seven thousand. that's it that's all you need to be to be in the top one percent that's how massive um yeah yeah top one percent of the top one percent of earners so like if you make about six hundred thousand dollars um, you are in the top 1%. That's how, that's how vast the difference is between the bottom 99 and the top 1%. When we're talking about millions of dollars, we're talking about a decimal point. So then like who, it, how much is everybody else making? Not that <laughs> most people probably make around what we make or less. I'd say. Jesus Christ. So then who the fuck is affording all of this like luxury housing and shit that's being built? Well, the I think the top one percent of the top one percent of the the, the one percentile. Yeah. So median wage is like 40k USD a year. And that's kind of what I'm saying. I make a little bit more than that. You know what I mean? Like not not much more, but I make I make a little bit more than that. If we're all sharing, I make 50K a year right now. My salary is $50,000 a year. And I've worked at this co- company for four years and I got hired on at 40. So I've gotten a couple wages in the past, uh, a couple a couple increases in the past four years, but I make 50K. I'm, I'm, you know, when I say like that, I'm like in the middle, like, you know, if, if PVK is correct and it's 40K a year is the average, I'm a little bit above average, but I still probably fall into that middle spectrum pretty, pretty cleanly. Should have joined a union, bro. I make like the same amount as you. Yeah. (laughs) But like way faster. (laughs) Um, But yeah. And like, you'd think that like, Hey, you know, um, the both of you guys, right. You know, are making like all this money. It's like, no, it's not enough for where we live in the Northeast. Like it's so bad out here. Like even making that amount, like it's a struggle to find anywhere to live, you know? Um, it's, I, I, I wish it wasn't like this, you know, but it's just like, we were just talking about before, if me or him like lose our job, like this stream is probably going to be over. Um, like (laughs) I'm going to lose my fucking, you guys start getting real generous, (laughs) you guys start getting real generous real quick. (laughs) Yeah. And I, and I think this is kind of what we were, what we're saying though, is that like, especially if you look at it in like a global standard, you know what I mean? If you look at like a global standard, you know, making $50,000 a year is like, you know, so for example, I went to India, right. And I'm a remote worker. So I worked for the, the entire six weeks that I was in India, um, save for some days that I took off to do some things while I was there, while I was working there by making $50,000 a year, but also, I was still paying for all my bills in Philadelphia because like, I didn't stop paying rent. I didn't lose my house to go on a six week when I went to India. But um, just from that money that I was making, forget all the bills and everything like that. The amount of money that it took for like food and like lodging was like so insignificant to like an American income or at least my American income. But, um, you know, the, when people in in India would ask me, how much do I make? I would tell them and they'd be like, holy shit, you're like a fucking, but then I tell them how much my rent is. And they're like, what the fuck? And I tell them how much, when I'm buying food for them, I tell them how much it costs. I tell them how many rupees it would cost in a restaurant in the United States. You know what I mean? Like it starts to say like, just because you're making $50,000 a year doesn't necessarily mean you're as rich as you would be if you lived in India. Well, I mean, it's kind of like when people go like, what people make how much, you know, a month in Cuba. And it's like, 
Yeah, but there's so much more of their everyday life that is subsidized in terms of like housing, food, health care and things like that, that like are a fucking drain on like that, like high amount of money that we make. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it, like, like we were just talking about before, if there's an issue with the car, right? Like, I'm not going to be able to make it to work, right? If there's an issue with like, you know, uh, health or something like that, like, and my wife is immunocompromised, like that, that's just hanging over our head, you know, that she might have like another health issue, like come up or something. Yeah. Um, and now Sam brings up having kids, you know, I don't have a child. We decided having- not to have kids. Having one child is like my entire life would be like in terms of financial, like my financial stability. I don't know what the fuck I would do. I mean, like there, there, there was a time where like we considered it, but it's just like thinking about where we are currently in terms of like how much money we make. Right. And the jobs that like are available to us. And then I think like, you know, we're forgetting about like the very human element of like, stress you know like i already deal with like a lot of like um like emotional and psychological stress from my job um i'm not going to get too into specifics but like i help people that are just getting out of incarceration um like you know and help help them like reacclimate back into the community and like it's tough it is not an easy job and uh you know compassion fatigue is very fucking real I have considered it. It's, you know, it's obviously a big, you know, big step because I was, I was living in Florida in like a very small house that was, that was cheap. And then I moved to fill it back to Philadelphia to be near my family. Um, and my family lives in New Jersey, which I would say is even more expensive than Philadelphia, because at least when you're in the city, you can kind of move to certain neighborhoods that have like relatively affordable, like row homes and like, and apartments and things like that. Um, (laughs) But right now I'm in a pretty nice house and I, and it's my one roommate moved out. I had more roommates and now I don't. So, um, I have to rectify that when my lease is up. I mean, like right now I'm my, my sister just had like two kids, you know, and, uh, my, you know, sister-in-law, she's having like a, another kid and whatnot. Right. Um, so like, you know, fucking, I'm not going to hate on somebody for choosing to have kids. And I really don't believe in the whole, like, you know, Oh, how could you ever like, you know, bring a kid into this world? I don't fault anybody for feeling that way, but like personally, like I I don't feel that way. Like people have been having kids for the last, uh, 300,000 years and, and, and going right. Like, and conditions like have always been, uh, not exactly great, you know? Um, but like I choose to be like the really cool uncle, Right. I, and I really want to have like a part in, um, in, in their life. And like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to fault them like, you know, for making that decision. I mean, honestly, like, you know, who, who am I to tell somebody like, you know, not to, to take that step in their life if they want to. I can't even afford to live in Mississippi, but I keep hearing how affordable it is for everyone that wants to move there. They ask me why I want to move, and it's just a lot to explain to people when they don't understand what it's like to live here. Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, especially with like, you know, didn't you guys just get hit with like a massive storm like a week ago? Um, I think that the short answer to that is yes. I think that socially, like for the social fabric of society, I think that's very helpful. But also, I do think that there could be a more equitable resource distribution um, in one way or another that could probably make like the living arrangements of families much more comfortable. Um, and it doesn't have to just be because of like a philosoph- philosophical, like, because a lot of those Eastern or, or other countries, it's not because of a necessary, it, it's partially, philo- I wouldn't say it's not because of an ethical philosophy, but also it's because these people can't simply can't afford to just be right. buying multiple properties. So it's like when you're turning turn 18, you don't move out and buy your own house. Your family owns a house and you're going to inherit that house from them and you're going to take care of them as they get older and they're going to help you take care of your kids you know and and that is partially because they think it's absolutely um an abomination that we send our old our our parents into nursing homes and things like that so it's definitely an ethical philosophy or like a, a foundational 
ethic that they have, but also it's because they simply don't have the economic luxury to buy multiple homes for multiple family members. I mean, my sister, if not for like, you know, the fact that she still visits my parents, like, I don't think she would be able to take care of those kids right now. Right. And you then know? that's the opposite. We, we hear about it a lot from people outside of this country that it's like, how could you let your parents live alone? Like, that's like the bad, how could you run out and you live your life and leave your parents? They need your help. But now we're seeing the opposite in the United States where kids are living with their parents out of economic necessity. Right. And like, you know, I think that, uh, look, yes, I, I think we my, could benefit from it. I lived right. with my parents until I could no longer, and it was more harmful to our relationship for us to cohabitate. Right than it was for for me to to not live there yeah well my mom lives in a in a trailer you know what right. i mean like if i wanted <laughs> to live, live with my mother it would be like impossible and also my dad is like kind of in like a rough situation with like drugs and stuff like that so it's like i just don't think i could live with his in his house i like to visit him and i love him but me as a recovering addict and he kind of is like since he's retired from the carpenters union he i think he's like letting loose his wild side a little bit because he had me in <laughs> He had me and my little brother kind of young and he was always like super straight for, for us. And then when we moved out and now he's got his like pension and everything like that from the carpenters union. Now he's just doing nothing but like riding motorcycles and getting fucked up. And it's like, if he's happy, I'm happy, but also it's like, I couldn't live in his fucking house. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. And then like, you know, for, for, you know, if my dad is watching, like, you know, I love you guys. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, it's just that like, Look, there's only so many people that can live under one roof. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So let's see uh, where else we're getting on in this here slideshow. Johnny, you want to take this one? Many who pretend to be on the left are so rabidly anti-Marxist as to seize upon any conceivable notion except class power, not sand power, class power to explain what is happening in the world they are the anything but class the abc theorists who while not allied with conservatives on most political issues do their part in stunting class consciousness to the extent that class is accorded any attention in academic social science pop sociology and media commentary it is as kind of demographic trait or occupational status so sociologists refer to upper middle or lower middle and the like. Oh, you took down the slide. Oh, I thought you were. I thought you were done. I was. I was pulling this up. I'm sorry. I thought you finished it. I was bringing okay, up the meme that Seb's put in here. Also, there's like a delay, so it's like. Oh, that was it. More. I'm sorry. My parents in their series. I think we're forward to have me in my thirties. <laughs> Should find <laughs> over earlier. I'll get over there. And, you know, I, I think that this this financial situation speaks a lot to like a lot of this like neoconservative trad red pill stuff where they're like, yeah. you know, everything is about the family. You know, a woman should be for having kids. A man should be, we should be about the nuclear family and putting it together. And like a good family structure is about is about having children. And it's like, dude, some people can't afford to have kids. I'm making more than like 40, you know, obviously me and my girlfriend could move out probably to somewhere like in the Midwest, leave my entire family here move to the Midwest, find something that's super cheap. Hopefully we don't lose our remote jobs, you know, which right. could happen at any fucked. time. Honestly, I don't have like tenure with this company or, or I'm not unionized. They could fire me tomorrow for like no reason. Um, you know, obviously I could do that. But the thing is, is like, even if I wanted to pursue like this trad life, um, red pill, like thing where like, I'm an, I'm an earner and my girlfriend is just going to clean and cook and bear children. It's like, we couldn't even afford a, a single income household, let alone without children, let alone with fucking children. Like, so like they, they, they act like it's like this moral degeneracy of the progressivism of the 21st century. But, and, well, I yeah. mean, these are the same people that oh, think, we can't afford it. <laughs> these are, these are the same people that think that like, you know, um, that, that, that like the economic side of things, right? Like, well, what are they like fiscally, um, liberal, but like, you know, socially, socially progressive or whatever. These are the same people that think that like, you know, that kind of shit where it's just like, you know, well, you just need to get out there and you need to find a better job. Grind. Sigma grind. 
Yeah, you need to go to garage sales and hustle people for their matchbox cars so that you can try and turn a profit on eBay, yeah. right? And then tongue kiss your dad. Um, like that's that's the Gary V mindset. You In know? ten years, I'll be almost forty-three years old. Stop talking. Stop Me? saying things like that. I'm just, I'm just saying it's like, you know, in 10 years. Yeah. Like, but, um, in 10 years, yeah. But it's like what for having a kid, like, you know, having your kid in your mid thirties, I mean, in your mid forties is like, you know, so like, you know, fucking that's the other thing is that like, I've considered oh, oh, have- yeah. and as liar Judas, <laughs> Chad knows a lot about me. I am a convicted. <laughs> So, so you've you've possibly overexposed yourself a little pat i'm not gonna lie. What, are they, what are they what are they gonna do exactly uh let's not push that so <laughs> um like you know I, i've talked about how i'm very close to like a lot of people out in colorado and shit like that right i know i know, um, I know. I'm, not, I'm not criticizing you i i i know we, we have an intimate relationship here <laughs> <laughs> um but like you know i have like um I've thought about moving out there, you know, like and trying to like find a job or something, but it's just like at the same time, um, then I, I know how Colorado often I visit. Expensive? What? Isn't Colorado super expensive? It, it is. It oh, is okay. super expensive. That's yeah. why like most of the people I know out there are moving out and like literally trying to move out of the country even. Um, <laughs> and so like, you know, uh, I know how often I visit them already and I can't imagine it instead of me visiting them, visiting my family and missing out on like, you know, years of Mm -hmm. like, you know, my nieces growing up and stuff. And it's just like, I don't, I don't want that. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, Where are we? Where are we now? We're deep in the weeds. We just got past the, we're on the first part of the ABC uh, theorists. And I think we were on, that first slide and I got up to upper middle, lower middle and the like reduced to a demographic trait. One's class affiliation certainly can seem to have relatively low political salience. Society itself becomes little more than a pluralistic configuration of status groups. Class is not a taboo subject. If divorced from capitalism's exploitative accumulation process. Right. So we kind of have this like more appropriated version of class that is not critical of capitalism's uh, exploitation. Well, I mean, like, think about it. Everything about like the way that we examine just just, just everything in this country, right, is devoid of class. Absolutely. Whether whether we're talking about, and we'll get to it later in the chapter, whether we're talking about race, whether we're talking about like, you know, trans rights or like, you know, LGBTQIA in general, right? Or we're talking about, um, you know, fucking any of it. Disabled people, for instance. Right. Forget it. So both mainstream social scientists and left ABC, anything about class theorists, fail to consider the dynamic in a relationship that gives classes their significance. In contrast, Marxists treat class as the key concept in an entire social order known as capitalism or feudalism or slavery. Centering around the ownership of the means of production, factories, mines, oil wells, agribusiness, media conglomerates, and the like, and the need, if one lacks ownership, to sell one's labor on terms that are highly favorable to the employer. Class gets its significance from the process of surplus extraction. The relationship between worker and owner is essentially an exploitative one, involving the the constant transfer of wealth from those who labor but do not own to those who own but do not labor. This is how some people get richer and richer without working or with doing only a fraction of the work that enriches them, while others toil hard for their entire lifetime only to end up with little or nothing. And I think that this is like an important thing here because – um, through this like delusional meritocracy perspective that a lot of people have of the American dream, um, where if you just work hard, um, where if you just work hard, um, that you will through the virtue of hard work, move up the, move up the ladder. And unfortunately that's just not the case. You can just look at migrant work. I would say migrant workers are probably the hardest, um, the hardest working people in this country. Would you disagree? Yeah. They're probably the least compensated and the hardest working people that exist in this, this country today. And um, their mobility is 
is abysmal. There is no mo- there is no mobility for these people. No, we've um, and, we've pretty much got a, a caste system in place in America. Right. And and in, and rem- I don't know if you remember, do you remember when we were going over the counter red when we were talking about like present day s- slavery in Georgia? Yeah. And um when there's these like literal like charges about this type of thing, it is to migrant workers. Like like these types of like insanely exploitative measures, methods are still being um, inflicted against migrant workers f- for the profit of owners. Yeah. So there's, um, I want to hear about the caste system in India sometime. Oh, oh do well. I have a book? Do I have a book for you? <laughs> <laughs> so maybe um, one day we'll go over that. Like, I would love to go over one of my favorite subjects that I think is really interesting is so caste in India does not formally exist anymore, but much like, like the civil rights movement of the United States, just because a lot of things were changed on paper, there is a resounding like systemic, those that were in the lower classes are still the worse off in India, just because the caste system is off the books. These are, these types of inequalities are baked into the system, but out of all of India, Kerala is um one of the most equal in terms of breaking down the um the 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 relics of the caste structure and it speaks to a very economically driven that caste was maintained through economics economic subjugation and it can also be remedied by like public initiatives and uh economic remuneration so before we move on to the next slide, there's that footnote that we were talking about before we started the stream that um, he talks about uh, this guy, Aaron now Aronowitz, Aronowitz and some other left academics do battle against Marxism by producing hypothesized exegesis in a field called cultural studies that they're often impenetrable writings seldom connect to the real world was demonstrated by 1996 physicist Alan Sokol, himself a leftist who wrote a cultural studies parody and submitted it to Aronowitz's Social Text, a journal devoted to articles that specialize in bloated verbiage, pedantic pretensions, and academic one-upmanship. Sokol's piece was laden with obscure but trendy jargon and footnoted references to the like of Jacques uh, Derrida and Aronowitz himself. It is purported to be an epistemistic exposition, or whatever that fucking word is, of recent developments in quantum gravity and the space-time manifold and foundational conceptual categories of prior science that have become problematized and relativized with profound implications for the context of a future postmodern and liberatory science. Various social text editors read and accepted the piece as a serious contribution. After they published it, Sokol revealed that it was little more than fabricated gibberish that wasn't obliged to respect any standard of evidence or logic. In effect, he demonstrated that the journal's editors were themselves so profoundly immersed and pretentiously inflated discourse as to be unable to distinguish between genuine intellectual effort and a silly parody. Aronowitz responded by calling Sokol ill-read and half-educated in the New York Times. One is reminded of Robert McChesney's comment, at some universities, the very term cultural studies has become an ongoing punchline to a bad joke. It signifies a half-assed research, self-congratulation, and farcical pretension. At its worst, the proponents of this newfangled cultural studies are unable to defend their work, so they no longer try, merely claiming that their critics are hung up on outmoded notions like evidence and logic, science and rationality, he says in the Monthly Review. In my opinion, parentheses, one of the main effects of cultural studies is to draw attention away from vital realities of class power and the outmoded things that cause Aronowitz and his associates to yawn. So yeah, um, that's how I, I think he's basically talking about uh, what you could describe as characters like Slavoj Žižek that like, you know, write these obtuse fucking like, you know, six layer deep anecdotal conversation he had one time 
about some fucking bullshit and extrapolated 600 pages uh, about a conversation um, regarding like toilets and hot dogs and shit and how that applies to like class analysis. Is this is this is this about Twitch? Don't you hit yourself to these elite success to these elites success through investing in their companies? Man, I, I'm just trying to find like a, if there was a platform that was like Twitch that wasn't Twitch, I would be on there. I don't really care. I mean, like the whole reason why we even decided to go through Twitch wasn't because like, you know, of any monetary reason. It was because we could interact with you on here like this. Yeah, I didn't I didn't want to dive into it because I was just curious about what they were. But I, that I, was like I, the only we originally this was going to be a, a fucking podcast, right? Then it they said in reference to the reading. Be, what they said in reference to the reading. So I was. I, that's why I asked. So I is saying. it a question for me, or is he, or are they asking like, is Parenti hitching himself? No, no. I think he meant oh, so like those that were being referred to. But it's all right. It's all right. No, oh, I'm sorry. My brain is like broken. Look, we got a cool video. Okay. Um, <laughs> everybody, look at the video. Look, every, <laughs> everybody, watch this video. All right, I'll be right back. I gotta get water. I have to pee too. But um, this is. Do you remember? Um, when we watched a video about the Philippines, about the war in the Philippines and like the, and the, the American um, imperialism in the Philippines, it was by this um, channel called the cynical historian, um, which I don't know a lot of his content. I don't know what his like actual like politics are or anything like that, but the, the video that he did about the Philippines was pretty good. And this one is pretty good too. This is pretty much like a, uh, a, a history of class struggle in the United States and kind of goes into a little bit of what, why that that has been diminished um over the the more recent decades have you ever heard that the usa is a classless society then why has there been class struggle in its history Hey, Cypher here. I was once a believer in the whole idea that America is a classless society. You know, the whole thing about America having no class structure, that there isn't a ruling elite or a bourgeoisie or a proletariat. But that's all changed as I've studied more and more of U.S. history. I'm no Howard Zinn now, but class struggle has existed within the U.S. Some of you may not know the importance of this subject. You know, why even bother arguing that the U.S. actually had class struggle in its history? Well, it has everything to do with Marxism. You see, Sam, are you referring to that 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 the United States is a classless society that people believe that? Because um, if that's what you're saying, I have the exact same thought. Like, does anybody um, does anybody um, actually believe that? Because I don't think I was ever under that impression. But then he claims that he was of that impression. So regardless of that potentially potentially ridiculous statement the actual like like um like historical matters that they that they reference i think are pretty on point but yeah i was right there with you on on that sounding very weird to me see according to marx there are distinct classes in industrialized societies there are the owners of the industry who can amass enough capital to benefit themselves and these capitalists make up the bourgeoisie or the middle class and they own the current paradigm and then there are the people who work for the bourgeoisie. These people are exploited by capitalists. Maybe it was poorly time. What I was asking is, aren't you, me, you're, are you referring to me, myself, um, able in part, hit yourself to the success of these publicly traded corps through investing in them? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, but is hitching yourself, you know, you know, you could say that hitching yourself is to some degree, you know what I mean? Like, you know how like the, those little fish hitch themselves to the side of a shark? Like they live under the fin of the shark. So they're like hitching to the shark and benefiting from the success of the shark by eating the scraps that fall to the sides of the shark's mouth. But that does not necessarily mean that there might not be like a more like equitable system for more people to enjoy the fish that is being consumed. Um, so there's that extremely interesting example that I just thought of. Um but you know, could they hitch themselves to the behemoth company that's making all the money? Um, 
those fish aren't going to become the shark. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, right, didn't you exactly. guys pay attention during GameStop and all that other shit? It's rigged <laughs> against you. If there was any chance for you to play the game the same way that they do, right? It'd be shut down. In order to make money, they are the proletariat or the labor class. Marx believed that in this power scheme was the ruin of the bourgeoisie. Eventually, the exploitation would be too much, and the proletariat would rise and create a socialist government instead. Anytime the proletariat fights against the bourgeois powers, that's class struggle. You might have heard of it as class conflict or warfare as well. Although conservative pundits use the class warfare analogy a little bit differently, but in reality, their terminology is based on Marxism. Now, I don't need to say that a lot of people have believed in Marxism, including a huge amount of historians. And so part of the Marxist historian's project is to go and find where class struggle has existed. In Thank you for subscribing, Ninja Can, at Tier 1. It is helpful to further their cause. Now, I'm no Marxist, but regardless of belief in Marxism, class struggle has undeniably existed in America. Numerous books have been published on this particular subject, most notably Strike by Jeremy Brecher and The People's History from Howard Zinn. But there's been stuff on all kinds of subjects, and much of it influenced by Marxism. All of them point to class struggle in America in numerous ways. Let's look at some specific examples. If you haven't yet, watch my video on violence in America. These subjects overlap in a lot of ways. Class-based unions and their struggles have always been good examples. America has not only had its fair share of union-based struggles and conflicts, but the U.S. has actually been pretty innovative in that regard. The Knights of Labor was one such innovation. It tried to organize all people who produced any kind of good under one union. Its membership counted 800,000 in 1886, but there was a massive railroad strike that year, which broke the union. You're then good, Ninja Can. Industrial thank you so much. The world, or the oh, thank IWW, you, thank often you so called much. the Wobblies. They also had the idea of one big union, but they were also very radical, calling themselves anarcho-syndicalists. Both the Knights of Labor and the Wobblies were... Um, is Zinn a Marxist? I don't actually know if he if he assumes that, that so title. Quick Googling. Howard Zinn, a communist? Zinn denied, <laughs> ever, Zinn denied ever being a member and said that he had participated in the activities of various organizations which might be considered communist fronts but that his participation was motivi motivated by his belief that in this country, people had the right to believe, think, and act according to their own beliefs. Man, <laughs> listen, I have a copy of the People's History of the United States downstairs. I think it's a cool book. I think that a lot of people will benefit from reading it, but you know, there's definitely kind of like with Chomsky. There's, there's a lot of cool yeah. stuff that we've written. There's a lot of cool perspectives that they have. They, they sometimes, oh, you know, Chomsky has some really good things on American foreign policy. You know, he's great at criticizing the United States. <clears throat> um, um, oh, fuck. You want to know what he thinks about the American revolution? <laughs> Howard, Z uh, Howard Zinn or, or yeah. Chomsky? What does Zinn say about the American Revolution? He's, uh, I'm, it's from the American Revolution Institute.org, and it's just a little excerpt. A few years before his death in 2010, Howard Zinn said that, quote, our highest ideals are expressed in the Declaration of Independence, end quote, uh, and that our history is, quote, is a striving, dot, 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 to make those ideals a reality. But he regarded the American Revolution as a vast fraud in which rich Americans used the rhetoric of equality and, you know, dot, dot, dot. So he's, he's not, he's not, he's not. Not a Pat Sock. Not a Pat Sock. All right. Well, he passed that test. Severely suppressed by the U.S. government. And also the socialist and communist parties made huge impacts on unionism in the U.S., at least until the McCarthy era. The FBI was actually created to basically fight Bolshevism in America, as in anarchists, communists, and their infiltration into labor unions such as the IWW. Hell, the entire year of 1919, also known as the First Red Scare, was just full of this stuff. 
pre-World War II, all unionist rhetoric was filled with class identification, and we historians have to accept cool. that they count as a class. You see, when people identified as a labor class, as part of a labor union, then that shows that there was a proletariat because they self-identified as such. But then the second Red Scare came along after World War II, and this whole ideology of labor class versus middle class was removed. Blacklists in the Taft-Hartley Act co-opted unions into expelling communists and any kind of socialists who might be affiliated with communists. And as part of that whole thing, that it decreased the whole class rhetoric. And then everybody just wanted to be counted as the middle class. You see, you won't have many Americans who won't identify themselves as being part of the middle class. Even if they are below the poverty line, there's numerous people who will self-identify as middle class. So class consciousness basically doesn't exist anymore. At least not in the Marxist way. But class struggle still exists. I mean, there was the Occupy movement a little while ago, and that whole term 99% is based on old class conflict principles, much of which is Marxist or at least socialist in origin. But unfortunately, that whole thing is actually meant to draw up the idea of the bourgeoisie, the middle class, that the 99% is the middle class and the 1% are the super ultra rich who are the elite. Whereas real class struggle was the other way around, where the labor class was fighting against the middle class, the bourgeoisie. So this whole ideology of middle class values that permeates our political rhetoric to this day is actually a tactic to avoid the whole idea of class struggle. You see, if nobody identifies as being part of the proletariat, then you just don't have a proletariat. So we may very well live in a classless society now, but that's only because we actively renounce Marxism. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> well, I think I think the point that they were making was that we live in a, the, this classless society exists because class has been like eviscerated from the discourse. Right. What well, we, I mean, it, it's one of those things where it's just like just because um, they're not like you know how would you phrase this just because like they're not identifying it as such does not mean that it doesn't exist it's kind of like that that whole um commentary quote on like marx not in inventing socialism you know or discovering socialism you know mm -hmm. where he says that like if i was here in africa like you know before um newton right uh came up with the term gravity right and i was doing any kind of scientific study right you know it would still be gravity, right, on like, you know, the rate of an object, you know, in motion tends to stay in motion until, you know, whatever. Yeah, Don't absolutely. Yeah. Finish that that existed before, but they, they named it, you know. Yeah, Kwame Ture. <clears throat> what did uh, I say? No, no, that, yeah, I think that's what you said, unless you maybe threw in a crewman in there by accident. I don't think I did. I don't think I could. All right, so moving forward, everyday class struggles. To support their view that the that class in the Marxist sense is passe, the ABC theorists repeatedly assert that there is not going to be a workers' revolution in the United States in the foreseeable future. I heard the sentiment expressed at three different panels during a Gramsci conference, conference at Amherst, Massachusetts in 87. Even if we agree with this prophecy, we might still wonder how it became grounds for rejecting class analysis and for concluding that there is no such thing as exploitation of labor by capital and no opposition from people who work for a living. The feminist revolution that was going to transform our entire patriarchal society <clears throat> has thus far not materialized, yet no progressive person takes this to mean that sexism is a chimera, shout out to chimera in the chat, or that gender-related struggles are of no great moment. <clears throat> That workers in the United States are not throwing up barricades does not mean class struggle is a myth. In present day society, such struggle permeates almost all workplace activities. Employers are relentlessly grinding away at workers and workers are constantly fighting back against employers. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's kind of a weird one. Um, well, for I, mean, old. Like, like, I even hesitate. I hesitate to even refer to myself as working class. Um, because I work from home and I work at my computer and I make a look like, like I make a little bit more than average. I even like, 
I don't want to wear like worker face. You know what I mean? Right. Like I, I, I think that some streamers are really cringe when they like saddle themselves up with the working class, despite <clears throat> perhaps never, you know, laboring in that sense that is generally referred to the working class. So like, even though I'm a, I'm, you know, somebody that comes from a working class family of, uh, of union carpenters, um, and that, you know, all of my initial workers, all of my initial jobs were working in restaurants and doing dishes and doing landscaping and things like that. Now I'm like more of like a, like a petty, I think I live on more of a petty bourgeois lifestyle. I, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I disagree. I don't think yeah. you're petty bourgeois. I, I think you're a worker. Like, you know, you do labor, like, you know, even if it is just because you're not like, you know, using your hands to tighten a fucking, you know, yeah. bolt, right. Working at a shop or some shit doesn't mean that you don't work. Right. Yeah. Or that you I'm not don't. saying I don't work. I'm just saying that I hesitate to, 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 to put myself right a lot I like especially like reading about like the super exploitation in the third world and everything like that like you know i try to be like it's not about me i'm not like you know it's not about me being like all of my problems there's just much more people that like m are, need this type of redistribution more than i do there's a lot going on in chat Thank there's, you, there's, there's, there's a lot of com it's just cool the takes for a second right as far as like my opinion on hassan yeah. right yeah. He has some dog shit takes, all right? They're not all winners. Some of them are pretty fucking bad, all right? But as far as, like, you know, the, the kind of reach, right? Like, I, I think it's fair to say that most of you are probably closer to 30 than you are 20, right? Except for Sebs. I think they're, like, the only Zoomer in chat, right? <laughs> so... Yes, some. All right. For the most part, he's at he's kind of like for for a lot of Zoomers, probably, he is probably their Chomsky, right? He is probably their touchstone to like, you know, deeper leftist politics. At least that's the fucking hope. All I right. I will say that I feel like he more times than not offers maybe like a surprisingly I am not uh, fucking hating on Zoomers. We need Zoomers. We really need to appeal to the Zoomer demographic. So we love Zoomers here. <laughs> um, I feel like he makes them like surprisingly like, you know, despite him like inhabiting this like leftist uh, streamer arc, which is like, you know, saying a lot of good things about Biden and saying a lot of good things like about like the like, you know, whatever, like the 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 green new deal Democrats, like or the the squad and things like that, that also he does at least offer like, um, he also does offer like when it, comes to, like, Cuba, when it comes to like Cuba and shit like that, like he does like generally have some like more palatable takes than other people that are al aligned with him. Yes. He is better than Voosh or Vouch or however you fucking pronounce his name. He's better than Hassan. He's better than destiny. Like he's far better than a majority of these fucking people yeah. that without him, where's the balance you, i'll i'll give you i'll give you my my thing on on hassan right so i yeah I agree. it's a low bar i mean like librarian it, it's a super fucking low bar look at where the fuck we live man i uh i'll give you my thing on hassan real quick um so i read a lot of books right like i'm when it comes to like getting my like political and my philosophical and my historical like like understanding of the world i like reading books uh, I, I would never like go to a streamer to like really get deeply influenced on that. Unless it's the verse of history stream where they are actually reading the books and, and, and bolstering the books with other data. Maybe the subversive history, the uh, uh, interactive podcast slash book club, but regular streamers know. So, but I will watch a sign. So, so, so when, when this whole thing happened with the cops in Memphis, right? Instead of putting on like the regular news, I'll throw on like Hassan to hear him talk about like that situation and some like current event thing that's happening in the United States. And uh, I think there's like some decent comic relief, like leftist comic relief that he offers. Yeah. But I would never like point someone to him to get enlightened politically. Like my wife, uh, honestly, that's like the only streamer where I can throw that on and she will not complain that it is like 45 minutes long, right? Every other one of these fucking nerds out here, she does not want to watch that shit, right? So, like, that's enough, 
right? My wife is like my gauge anecdotally, right? And I recognize it's anecdotal. Of like what a normal person. <laughs> yes, yes. Of like what a normal person can like withstand listening to for an extended period of time. Who cares yeah. about other streamers just do your thing? I mean, like, look, I, we live in a we very are. complex social environment, right? And it, 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 we're, we're not like oblivious to the fact that like, you know, this is a... Uh, both both a competitive but also a very tiny community of people that are willing to like you know have the kind of analysis that we have we yes we live in a society we live in a society okay let me put real close so you can joker five that's, that's the <laughs> that's the overall don't base your views on a fucking streamer. Like, yeah, don't, don't just think that you can just log in and watch a streamer. Cause like, even me, like we're on here for four and four and a half hours and things like that. Um, and it's like, you know, sometimes I'll say things that are like, not like, like I'll go back and I'll be like, wait, did I use the wrong word there? Or did I say it? like, it's like, you know, <laughs> read, read the books. Yes. I mean, that's a fucking thing All right, again. Right. Our opinions, right right? You should not be listening to our opinions, right? You should be listening to what we're reading out of the book. You should be reading more of Pat's slides than giving a shit about what either of us fucking have to say about it. But like what we are offering, like our comments about it, because we've read more than these books, or we're aware of more than what's outside of these books, right? So the, to create like an interactive environment, right? For people like you chat to interact with it. Right. And like the idea is in a perfect world, right, that like we can hopefully inspire you to put some time in your day to read like one chapter, like one chapter, like every like two between two or three days. Right. Yeah. On average, we're reading about like 10, maybe 15 pages. Right. Um, Thanks every day. Thanks for the every, bit. Every two or three days. an ml respecting sock dam that's kind of what he was like that's kind of what, what he, he was kind of i mean he doesn't talk shit about china to be honest i think he has if i'm being honest here i think he adds a layer of protection to some of the things that he believes when it comes to um <laughs> when it comes to like china and the soviet union things like that like i think he offers like yeah you know things are you know there's a lot of bad things that go on but like i think if you got him off stream to talk about stuff i think that you'd you'd see like a more um um positive sense i mean like look i That's watch like, his i watch yeah. his content enough you know to to like you know again not agree with him on everything oh shit do we we have we're close to a hype train what the fuck oh thank you for know. the bits liar judas shit oh. i hardly even noticed but um again soon we're gonna have like the explosion of bullshit across the screen when yeah. people do stuff like that but um, look, 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 look. Who cares what? Who cares what the fuck Hassan thinks about fucking anything, right? Who cares what the fuck we think about fucking anything? The point is interact with like the material far more. Um, what's the word? Um, credentialed people, right? Thank you for the two hundred bits, Hash Kush. Oh, oh shit, that, we got a fucking hype train incoming. I don't even know if is that mean that it's already here. <laughs> Fucking, you have oh. a little bit of time to earn exclusive emotes. Oh yeah, shit, man. we're at a level one hype train. Fuck. Um, here, Pat, have you ever heard of uh, the song uh, "Gotta Run" by Apache? You don't want to do the Kenyan stuff. Nah, we're gonna do this one because I okay. love it, and I can't get it out of my head. Because I love it, and I love it. Super whoop. Oh, cinnamon challenge. I think uh, those are bits, right? Oh, they are. Thank okay. you. Th oh, thank you. Holy shit. We are at a level one hype train. Thank you so much. Cinnamon challenge. Nick Sachs. Who's Nick Sachs? What the fuck is this? <laughs> the Dewey decimal number song. <laughs> Thank you, Grave Wax, for subscribing at tier one for three months. You rock. La Salam. Thank you so much. All right, Grave Wax. Thank you. 
you're the one who won. Pat's going to hate Nick Sachs. He's going to hate it. I'm, I'm promising you right now. I want another few hearts in that way. Where are these people from? Where do you think? Uh, Ukraine? No. You the former Slavic nation? This is definitely Slavic. I'm pretty certain they're Russian. <laughs> there. All right, let's do it. That that is no. <laughs> Fuck the French. I'm not doing that. <laughs> shit, we're at level two hype trade. Holy shit. I wonder how much money Adidas makes, like, in Eastern Europe. The bear is a clue. What is this? What is this? Level 2 from 2. Oh, is that even further? Oh, holy shit. Uh, Astro, I need to get some 10 tier 1 subs. Holy shit. Thank you, Hashkush. Wow, holy shit. Patrick, how do you keep doing this? How? Do you how? Doing this? I don't know what it is you do or what like field of work you're in, but thank you so much. Welcome. To, oh, we're, up to, uh, you're, we're about to beat our last record. So uh, apparently we have some sort of record, but Hashkush, you are the absolute MVP of this situation. <laughs> <laughs> the first newfound glory album just came out. I sent I sent you another link if you want to put that on while we got the hype train going. We should put like a playlist together though. Especially if this keeps happening, if Hashkush keeps coming into chat and just fucking Yeah, absolute yes. mad laugh. That's the Kenny Junior Norman Payne and Kev. You are an absolute angel. And just part of the foundation of this team. Covered in spaff. Covered in spaff. Hashkush is Hasan Abi's <laughs> Hashkush is just Hasan Abi's fucking, you know, alter ego where he just goes into random, like, lefty Twitch channels. It's like... Can I go smoke my pipe with a random man in a dark and weary nook? For to transcend a man two pints, can I get lucky and fist him tonight? You stick my cock with a pink hair tie. Not too tight, though, I don't want to die. You have a dog, his name was Francis. Then he ran away, what a selfish bastard. I got a cat and his name is Patrick. And it's, like, hard for me to believe that, like, this is, like, the most, like, fucking popular shit in, like, English, UK rap right now. Like, hello, 
I'm like, hi, do you want to back up? Do you want to die? Do you want to catch up? Do you want to die? Do you want to slice the painful part? Guys, got a best friend. Her name's Andy. She's got a husband. His name's Andy. I like to picture them when they fuck. And imagine that that's they sweet like candy. Who's got a camera? Want to take a picture? Got a good shot to my best friend's sister. She's bent down with her hand on red rock card in the middle of a game of Twister. I play the horns, the horns of death. The horns of death. I'm obsessed. I'm sticking in the wank bank back to the nest. And his candle lights lay back and caress. I'm not alone. The voice in my head tells me I'm handsome and great. What's their hype name? They, their hype man's name is like Kevin or something. When I say hi, I get dances around, down, around like this. I get stressed out. When I go people around, I'm anxious. Nobody likes me. What the fuck now? When I say hi, I get shut down. When I'm outside, I get stressed out. When I go people around, I'm anxious. Nobody likes me. What the fuck now? Yeah. <laughs> you guys are crazy. All right. So what, what do you what do you all know about rap from Palestine? Thank you, Hashkish, again for another hey. two hundred bits, keeping Just this train a chugging. Just making it rain in here. I sent you yet another link, Pat. You're wanting to present a counter argument that proves Hassan doesn't obscure a mystified class, then just make it no need for deflection. What? Y'all heard a uh, Tamer Nafar? Our dream has been level three. Level four. Level four. 57 percent level four. Thank you, everyone who contributed. Thank you, Ashford. Holy shit. Thank you so much, everyone. You're all the best. Thank you. Oh, that one. Do you see the level three height thing in the what are they doing? Like what even is that? No, we don't talk blank. So we don't talk blank. We're entire singing starters, then you blow brain. Do you want to talk blank? Because I can talk blank. Man, I'm not playing go there. I'm not trying to get DCM made. What the fuck? Like that, or no, not DCMA. That's a that's a fucking that's a terms of service right there, bro. Watch the video for fucking go there. Like, do you not remember the beginning? Yeah, exactly. LOL. Yeah. Yeah, LOL. It's amazing. The video is amazing, so watch it, but like um I can't watch it on stream for you. I'm sorry. Like that'll absolutely get us terms of service. It's wild and super graphic in the beginning, uh heroic skeleton. I gotta find that TikTok of um, like a stereotypical scene out of like you know a movie taking place in the Middle East or whatever. It's fucking amazing. Is it like the thing with Mexico? It's kind of like that. Yes. <laughs> it probably wasn't until like four or five years ago. That I was
All right. Fun times, everybody. We are all having a very fun time. This has been a very fun stream. You want to read this one, Johnny? Sure. Everyday class struggles. Capital's class war is waged with court injunctions, anti-labor laws, police repression, union busting, contract violations, sweatshops, dishonest clocking of time, safety violations, harassment and firing of resistant workers, cutbacks in wages and benefits, raids of pension funds, layoffs, and plant closings. Labor fights back with union organizing, strikes, slowdowns, boycotts, public demonstrations, job actions, coordinated absenteeism, and workplace sabotage, and most recently, quiet quitting. Class has a dynamic that goes beyond its immediate visibility, whether we are aware of it or not. Class realities permeate our society, determining much about our capacity to pursue our own interests. Like reading. Class power is a factor in setting the political agenda, selecting leaders, reporting the news, funding science and education, distributing health care, mistreating the environment, depressing wages, resisting racial and gender equality, marketing entertainment and the arts, propagating religious messages, suppressing dissidents, and defining social reality itself. Yeah. So, I mean, and, you know, just based on that first part, we can obviously look back at the first stat that I brought up um, about like, you know, the absolutely disproportionate amount of uh, upper class individuals that make it into our political structure and maintain our political structure. Um, you can definitely see this playing out and how that has a consequential or a subsequent response in terms of like things like anti-labor laws, things like uh, um privatization um efforts and so on and so forth and you know the fact that you know is you know why is there not universal health care in the united states you know why isn't there better um wage laws in the united states hey everybody in chat chill about the hassan bullshit we're moving on all right cool all right we're all here to learn not argue about whether hassan is whatever And yes, I love the band Damn Heroic Skeleton. You guys are the best. Um, is it ironic that some left intellectuals should deem class struggle to be largely irrelevant at the very time class power is becoming increasingly transparent? At the very time, corporate concentration and profit accumulation is more rapacious than ever, and the tax system has become more regressive and oppressive. The upward transfer of income and wealth has accelerated public sector assets are being privatized corporate money ex exercises and increasing control over the political process people at home and abroad are working harder for less and throughout the world poverty is growing at a faster rate than overall population so uh this is also an interesting um take on like what is happening in the united states in terms of like kind of like an overton window that has shifted and shifted and shifted like since the early early 20th century to the point where like we've been neutered of a lot of our class consciousness and um, labor activism. Um, yeah. So, you know, what happened with Reagan in the eighties, which was like, you know, which would probably be like looked at as like sacrilegious and blasphemous to many of the people that came the decades prior, what was implemented then has now become just status quo. It's not even looked at like, as like, it's, it's just standardized now. So yeah. we move more and good. Did you say, did you say something? No, uh, no, I just said, yeah. But I mean, like, I would say even further, I mean, specifically, right? Something like what Reagan did would have been, uh, what is it? What, what's the word? Like antithema to, to everything that like the labor movement of like yeah. the 20s and 30s stood for when there were still socialists involved. There were still communists, like open communists involved before the McCarthy era. And a lot of those people were, you know, uh, they had their lives destroyed, jailed, you, you know, like the entire union movement was broken and it was at its strongest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now you have to be careful saying even the word union when you're at work. Frankster, I'm in a fucking union. My own fucking like fellow people, right, that I work with don't even know if they're paying their dues right? They don't fucking care. Some of them don't even want to be in the union or have the union. They, they think that like the, the union is actually a bad thing and it keeps lazy people getting rewarded and keeps people from getting fired. There's, 
It's it's so fucked. Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right. Oh, but the people I'm talking about are not boomers. They're they're like my age. <laughs> Um, seizing upon anything but class, U.S. leftists today have developed an array of identity groups centering around ethnic, gender, cultural, and lifestyle issues. These groups treat their res respective grievances as something apart from the class struggle and have almost nothing to say about the increasingly harsh politi politico-economic class injustices perpetrated against us all. Identity groups tend to emphasize their distinctiveness and their separateness from each other, thus fractionalizing the protest movement. To be sure, they have important contributions to make around issues that are particularly salient to them, issues often overlooked by others. But they should also, they also should not downplay their common interests, not overlook common class enemy in they face. The forces that impose class injustice and economic exploitation are the same ones that propagate racism, sexism, militarism, ecological devastation, homophobia, xenophobia, and the like. So I, I think he makes an excellent point that a lot of people have lost, especially people that are trying to push like either like the Pat Sock line, you know, or some other like, you know, the, 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 the they always either end up calling it like id poll or identity politics or like, you know, now they're trying to use the term fucking woke as if just changing the word, but nothing else about like what they're really fucking getting at, you know? But uh, what Parenti is talking about is that it's not a, a, dis, a dismissal of the issues of the stratification of class under like, you know, specific um, immutable characteristics of people, right? Under the, the, the social system that they live within, right? It's that those people with those immutable characteristics, right? With those immutable like traits, right? Should not forget, right? That their class plays a part in that. Like you, right. you could, you could be like, you know, the, uh, a trans black woman and like, you know, the head of a fucking company on like the board of CFOs or whatever the fuck. Right. Um, and have like a unique, uh, form of persecution against you in like your everyday daily life. But as far as like class goes, you don't have the same life as let's say the poor black trans woman living in like fucking Kensington, Philadelphia. Right. Uh, and I think that this is kind of like the measured response that that is to be taken when you're straddling the line between class reductionism and you know, like cl like maybe race reductionism or insert right. um, identity characteristic reductionism. Um, whereas, you know, you don't need to like just like wave away all of these identity distinctions that affect people's day-to-day -day lives and they expect uh, th and they they endure discrimination for these various identities but also at the same time you should you you, you can acknowledge the class the class um position in addition to these things and see how a lot of these inadequacies are a consequence of class hierarchy yes fucking i wanted to see if there was like another do you want to read this one or yeah people may not develop a class consciousness but they still are affected by the power privileges and handicaps related to the distribution of wealth and want these realities are not canceled out by race gender or culture the latter factors operate within an overall class society the exigencies of class power and exploitation shape the social reality we all live in racism and sexism help to create a super exploited categories of workers minorities and women and reinforce the notions of inequality that are so functional for a capitalist system to embrace a class analysis is not to deny the significance of identity issues, but to see how these are linked both to each other and to the overall structure of politico-economic power. 
and awareness of class relations deepens our understanding of culture, race, gender, and other such things. Literally, like, just repeating in a much more concise manner what I was just trying to say before. And me too. That's why I wanted to move to that slide because that same thing of just like, not like, not like being like overly fixated and also not overly dismissive of either right. class or identity, which is in my opinion, both like a fallacious way of looking at our social relations. You know what I mean? We can yeah, I mean, uh, like, recognize. Look, look at the history of the CP, uh, uh, CP USA. They dismissed black issues, right. As secondary, right. And yeah. it fucked them. Right. And, um, you know, and, and also, you know, catch I'm, up Lord. Hey, catch up Lord. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the first time chat. Um, you know, and I'm also here as a white guy. You know what I mean? I'm a white guy that's here. And who am I to be like, no, uh, your your identity category is is meaningless. It's all about class. You know what I mean? Right. When, a, when a black person is telling me that they have a distinct um, position in this class hierarchy that, that differs from mine because there is a racial opponent, a racial component of their like, um, um, oppression within this system that is, that is different than mine. Right. You know, and that's why I think that defining it, all classes matter. Son of a bitch. <laughs> um, and yes, librarian, I do believe that was under Earl Browder when that happened. And maybe we can read a book in the future, um, like diving deeper into that history. I think um, VJ writes about it in Washington Bullets, right? So here's a question that I wanted to ask you, right? And I, and I kind of, this is a little bit maybe sketchy grounds for me to be on. Um, 1000% catch up Lord. I, I could not agree more that um, these things are not yeah. stay tuned. We'll definitely be reading that. Which soon. is e exactly why I am consistently trying to bring like, you know, issues regarding first nation sovereignty and independence. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and right to the land back all of it uh, into our program on a regular basis. Yep. Right. Because colonialism, um, you know, maybe one day when we go over Mao and we become subversive theory, we can talk over like primary and secondary contradictions. Right. But I think that colonialism is the primary contradiction of the settler state that is the U.S. I'm sorry. Go on, Pat. No, very nice. Very nice. That was great. Um, I'm agreeing with everything. Also, stay tuned for Washington Bullets. Maybe that'll be our first read after um, Sword in the Shield, which starts on Wednesday. What do you say we do Washington Bullets after that? Yeah. I think that's perfect, right? Yeah. It's a short book. We can. It's kind of like this too, where we can go into like each chapter is very like um, specified. It gives us like a lot to focus on each chapter. Librarian, stay tuned in about one month after we finish Sword in the Shield, which we're going to go over during Black History Month. Um, yes. We're going to do, uh, we're going to do Washington bullets. Yes. All right. Everybody make sure you get a copy, get a PDF, get whatever, yeah. you know, get the audio book, you know, get ready for, uh, not February, March, right. It's already been decided. Washington bullets. It is. All right. Fuck. Yeah. All right. We're all excited. Everybody's having fun. And guess what? You should all continue to be excited because we got a video and <laughs> I had to, I had to include this one. Um, you locked out of the disc. How did that, what did, I'll, I'll figure it out. All right. Minus one, by the way. What is the minus? So now this is a, this is called class dismissed as in dis the dismissal of class. Uh, fun little double entendre there. Um, and I had to just include this one because it includes uh, Beavis and Butthead and The Simpsons, uh, both within this. And it turns, it talks about media and class and the kind of like suppression of the class issue within media. So let's all have a good time and watch this. While television has provided a comfortable home for the middle class for over 50 years, many of its most memorable characters have been working class. Though producers insist that television is meant to entertain and not to educate, blue-collar shows have undeniably played a pivotal role in shaping our perceptions of working-class people. But because we see television as just entertainment, we readily disregard its impact on our thinking. It's precisely because we believe television is merely entertainment that we need to take its image of the working class seriously.
It turns out that in the United States, uh, about 62% of the labor force are working class people. That is people who go to work, they do their jobs, uh, they go home, they go to another job, but they don't have a lot of control or authority over their work. Well, the, the frustrating thing is that every time you try to bring up the subject of uh, economic injustice and uh, the fact that so many Americans work full time and don't make enough to live on, et cetera, some conservative is going to say, that's class warfare. And you can't say that. Uh, we're, all, we're all supposed to get along and ignore that. You know, being working class seems kind of like a lifestyle choice where people, you know, like pink flamingos and tacky uh, furniture in their house and uh, don't have much taste. Just trying to give your family a little culture. Bet if I shoved it in a hot pocket and smothered it in Belvita, the four of you would be out back wrestling over it. <laughs> so if people choose to have lower incomes when class in reality, is powerfully structured by social forces. So Jerry Springer, who introduces his show with a television and a trash can, is where all the qualities associated with white trash are on display. And it's interesting because it's a multiracial world. It's a sort of equal opportunity spectacle because the common link here is social class. And behind the scenes, of course, by the producers, these people are referred to as trailer trash. Uh, so they are condescended to behind the scenes and they are sought out and coached to behave in a particular way. And what images of the working classes do we see there? These people are out of control. They have no discipline. Uh, their sex lives are all over the place. And married with children, it's so over the top. And the fact that these, this family, the Bundys themselves, are totally disenfranchised. That they simply do not have access to the American dream. These families give rise to a couple kinds of kids. Either they're smart and talented, which reinforces the myth of meritocracy. These kids are going to make it out regardless of the circumstances. Or the kids are deviant in a number of ways. You know, the Bart Simpson type. Ooh, let's go break something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the two biggest troublemakers are definitely Beavis and Butthead. And these guys celebrate stupidity and they live for sex and violence. It plays on a generation of youth raised in a media-saturated society of junk culture, commodity, and alienation, where the parents are driven out of the home and into the labor force, and where the TV becomes the babysitter and the role model. There is an element of working-class revenge for these two guys that surely come from broken homes and a disintegrating community where school and work in the fast food industry are meaningless, and they're downwardly mobile with a bleak future, if any. <laughs> They did. In good times, all the characters knew that they were being exploited. They were always struggling against the man. No, man, I tell you the way it is. I got a family. They need food on the table and clothes on their back, and I got to pay rent. Now, I need that job. Government rules can't be broken. Unless you're running the government. <laughs> but they always had these dreams, like classic American dreams, that if they work hard, that they'll finally get out of the projects and they'll succeed. Baby, without money, people like us ain't got no chance at all. But it ain't always gonna be that way, James. And of course, that doesn't happen to the very end of the program, the last episode, which is sort of like Gilligan's Island, where they get off the island and they, they escape the, the projects. There is a certain kind of criminalization of the black body, so that black masculinity is seen as a place of fear. It's a way of trying to use race as a substitute to talk about class, since so much of our tradition is about individual mobility and sort of making it through the American dream. Some of what I think cop shows do is to reinforce this universe about not only who is criminal in the kind of collective imagination, but the inevitability and the kind of naturalness of it. The whole conservative political agenda of the last 30, 40 years has been to attack the poor, which is really to attack workers because most people who are poor are workers. They work for a living, or, but they have low wages, or they have experience of unemployment. So if we talk about the poor as something that's separate from workers, we're making a big mistake. This is not a narrow working class interest. We're losing, we're losing essentially a century of, of, of industrial and uh, economic progress, even as we speak. That was the guy that Parenti was quoting. 
that was like a stuck up asshole. It means restraining the large corporations who are controlling the destiny of the United States to the detriment of the American people. You can't change the portrait of corporate television to make us look more realistic and more complex and more humane without changing the inhumane situation that we live in. And so social movements and social struggles um, around other issues in our society are tied directly to media representation. I'm sorry, I'll you know, stay so away from the mic. It's not enough to fight at the level of media. You've got to do everything at once. And when you do that, when you make new people, you've got to make new television. A little something there. Yeah, I, I promise also that uh, while television has provided a comfortable when we uh, when the when the stream looks newer and more refined, um, my my audio levels just our audio levels in general could be so much better. I, I can't wait for you guys to see it. Yeah. <laughs> moving on up. We are moving on up to the east right. side. John, you want to read this one? Sure. In order that a select few might live in great opulence, millions of people work hard for an entire lifetime, never free from financial insecurity and at great cost to the quality of their lives. The complaint is not that the very rich have so much more than everyone else, but their superabundance and endless accumulation comes at the expense of everyone and everything else, including our communities and our environment. Great concentrations of wealth give the owning class control not only over the livelihoods of millions, but over civic life itself. Money is the necessary ingredient that gives the rich their immense political influence, their monopoly ownership of mass media, their access to skilled lobbyists in high public office. To those who possess it, great wealth also brings social prestige and cultural dominance, including membership on the governing boards of foundations, universities, museums, research institutions, and professional schools. Likewise, the absence of money is what makes the have-nots and have-littles relatively powerless, depriving them of access to national media and severely limiting their influence over political decision makers. As the gap between the corporate rich and the rest of us grows, the opportunities for popular rule diminish. And like, fucking dude, th think about it like this, right? The reason why I think a lot of right-wing people are and you've heard it probably been described as like a culture war right um i think the reason why we are at such a point where people are bickering about um you know uh, uh marvel versus dc or like they put a trans character in or they put an interracial couple in the fucking you know ad for you know my medication or whatever the fuck and like they made my m ms not sexy anymore right <laughs> is like <laughs> they they made my m&ms unfuckable um <laughs> T tucker carlson is one of few but victims nonetheless um is that like all we have left is the spectacle right and you know how we were talking about like oh the the tradition right the trad you know lifestyle that we used to live right pat yeah um and in that, like, you know, the spectacle, the spotlight of the spectacle has not even drifted further away from like this traditional white married couple with 2.5 kids. Um, it's that the spectacle has widened its its reach to also extend to, you know, black people, interracial couples, trans or gay people or, you know, disabled people or anything like that. It's not that like traditional media has gone away or anything. It's just that the spectacle of, of showing you in like, you know, uh, uh, on the, the pretty light screen, right, um, is all we have left. That's all we have left to, to talk about, to fight about, to have any sway over, to go on the internet and be like, I don't like this. Take her off that show. Right. Because um, politics, arguing about it for decades, hasn't gotten us anything. Right. Um, and I, that's the other thing is like, um, I like the part where it says, the complaint is not that the very rich have so much more than everyone else. 
um because it's like that's like such like a common um yes um, it's a refrain uh we hear like they're like marxists or communists or whatever socialists are just socialists because they're jealous like Mm -hmm. they're jealous of like what everyone else what what the rich have and they want to have it and it's like my desire to be my desire for socialism does not come from me necessarily wanting to enrich myself um i look at it as as a moral imperative to the things that i see as like grossly inhumane that happen around me i don't even think that i would be the primary beneficiary of worldwide socialism i think that my standard of life may even decrease so that the lives of the the third world or the global south can be improved significantly and i'm willing that i'm willing to have my standard of living uh degraded to some degree if it meant that other people weren't treated like human capital, human cattle. I mean, and it's going to be honestly like what level of your life is going to be degraded, right? So long as like, if we are actually receiving like, you know, healthcare, housing, education, and these other things that like are a human right, I really don't care if there's less brands of toothpaste or less options of bread for me at the fucking store. Right. right. I, I really don't fucking care if like, you know, I, I can't have like, you know, Mickey D's Taco Bell or fucking, you know, uh, Popeye's chicken for dinner or some shit. If, right. if that means that the quality of life is improving globally, you know what I mean? And yeah. like what kind of like socialism is it where like these things that are absolutely necessary that honestly take up the chunk of like, you know, the, the, the majority of our wages, like what, what, what kind of revolution is it if that isn't being addressed? You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I agree. Mm-hmm. Very, I agree precisely. And also I may even be engaging in a little bit of a misconception about what the world is capable of producing. You know what I mean? There may yeah. very well be enough production and enough productive capabilities that everyone can live like an upper middle class person. So long, because remember what we were saying before is that to be the 1%, you make 600,000. Right. If you took the many billions and millions that are being, you know, squandered for like the, you know, super abundance of the ver- the, the the richest of the rich, you know what I mean? There could be maybe even a a, a better parody for my life. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, like the top end may be that extreme. Right. It's like Sam Jervis is saying, it's not the poverty, it's the inequality. We live every day that will turn us insane. Like, I, I think that, like, if the people that are making 500K, right, are making significantly less, right, is their quality of life honestly going to change that much, right, uh, to the point where it's not, and, and that, and they're such a, like, you know, minority, like, it, it, does it really matter that their life changes that much so that the people making even less than me and you and are living a worse quality of life drastically improves? Right. And we're coming up to a point where I I think we're going to talk about like, you know, um, what is it like kind of like what we talked about in the divide about like, you know, we don't have an issue of of uh, production. We have an issue of distribution distribution. Yeah. This is why we are throwing out gross amounts of our food while people while millions of people die of hunger every year. Right. Do you want to read this one? Yeah, sure. Wealth buys every comfort and privilege in life. The fame of fortune, elevating the possessor to the highest social stratosphere, an expression of the aggrandizing self, an expansion of the ego's boundary, an extension of one's existence beyond the grave, leave one feeling almost invulnerable to time and mortality. Wealth is pursued without moral restraint. The very rich try to crush anyone who resists their endless, heartless, unprincipled accumulation. Like any addiction, money is pursued in that obsessive, amoral, single-minded way, relieving a, revealing a total disregard for what is right or wrong, just or unjust. And indifference to other considerations and other people's interests, and even one's own interests, should they go beyond feeding the addiction. Capitalism is a rational system, the well-calculated systematic maximization of power and profits, a process of accumulation anchored in material obsession that has the ultimately irrational consequence of devouring the system itself and everything else with it. Yeah, I mean, like, you know how we've talked about, like, Cybersyn before, Project Cybersyn out of Mm -hmm. uh, Chile? Like, think about it, like... 
everything that Amazon does, everything that Walmart does, everything that every major capitalist country that just like, you know, um, transports goods, commodities, things, right, is using uh, what like CyberSyn was working towards, but towards the maximization of the accumulation of profit, not towards like, you know, um, an equitable system of distribution to those who lack, so it's right. not as if we don't have tools that can be like you know uh, used in such a way. It's just that like we don't have a system that wants that. Exactly, exactly. Um, it is not incentivized to have that. Yes, that is actually the opposite yes. of what the system is geared towards. Because if you don't have the the lower class you have no one to sustain like you know the the labor force right. the exploitable labor force force the um um what is that called um the like surplus the, labor uh, surplus labor yeah or sur there's, uh yeah i think that's it there's a big surplus in the world that is literally just being thrown into the ocean in communism everyone can have a two million dollar house be a fed and a last for as long as needed <laughs> plus less trash which less pollution Yeah. So and now we're getting like, into the good. No, no, keep, no, keep going. No, I was going to say we're now we're getting into the last sub chapter here, um, which afterwards I do want to go over that Wikipedia page with all the stats in it about social um, social mobility. Do you want to read this one? Sure. In 1876, Marx's collaborator Friedrich Engels offered a prophetic caveat. Let us not flatter ourselves over much in account, on account of our human conquest over nature, for each conquest takes its revenge on us. At every step, we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature, like a conqueror over a foreign people, like someone standing outside of nature, but that we, with flesh, blood, and brain, belong to nature and exist in its midst." With its never-ending emphasis on exploitation and expansion and its indifference to environmental costs, capitalism appears determined to stand outside nature. The essence of capitalism, its raison d'etre, is to convert nature into commodities and commodities into capital, transforming the living earth into inanimate wealth. This capital accumulation process we wreaks havoc upon the global ecological system. It treats the planet's life-sustaining resources, arable land, groundwater, wetlands, forests, fisheries, ocean beds, rivers, air quality, as disposable, dispensable ingredients of limitless supply to be consumed or toxified at will. Consequently, the support systems of the entire ecosphere, the planet's thin skin of fresh air, water, and topsoil are at risk, threatened by such things as global warming, massive erosion, and ozone depletion. So there's, so um, PVK, I think that that's uh, legitimate, that most systems will inherently consolidate power in the hands of the select and often corrupt few. Um, I think that that's a, a, a reasonable suspicion to have about any anyone who gets into power that there's someone corruptible my my response to that would be that so right now we have this system of capitalism where wealth accumulation dictates your um your accountability in a sense where there is no democratic process by which that I can, I, I can't do anything to the very richest in society that own companies and things like that. They have much, a lot of say in my life and about the political structure that I exist in, but they're absolutely unaccountable to me unless you believe in that vote with your dollar bullshit. Where like, if I don't, right. if I don't go to Walmart or I don't, you know, engage on social media or something like that, that like I'm voting with my dollar. Now, if we have like maybe a more uh, politically centralized system with, you know, more nationalization or more of like an overstructure over these companies where they become more accountable to democratic means um, with, you know, through hyper privatization, they're just moving further and further away from the, the democratic process that could be being engaged with from the local level up. So, I mean, if there was some process of nationalization or at least rigor, rigorous state controls that maybe I as a taxpayer could contribute to with a vote or at least having some accountability to me that they don't currently seem to have, unless you believe like you can just go shop at a different store or buy a different product, which I think uh, has demonstrated to be like wholly inadequate in terms of reeling in these, these, these monopolistic or, you know, major business powers. It has. 
Um, <laughs> there, there have been like a number of academic studies that have already proven that like, you know, the average voter, right. Or even the majority voter, right. Oh, this is another interesting. Uh, so Seb's Deb. So, you know, we live in a society that is inundated, <laughs> that, that is inundated by like a capitalist frame of mind, an individualized pursuit of wealth accumulation and individual power structure and individual safety and shelter within this community. There is, you know, maybe a logic that under socialism, um, you know, uh, that under socialism, there would be maybe some type of a paradigm shift uh, throughout the way that people view themselves and the way that they are in their community. And this could maybe potentially lessen this like rugged pursuit of individual success. I mean, um, you know, I think you can find obviously in the Soviet Union, a lot of fucking issues with people in the communist party. That, that's how we got Yeltsin. That's how we got Gorbachev. That's how we got the disillusion of the Soviet Union because of corrupt people seeking out their own their own profit at the expense of the people. Um, but also throughout the Soviet Union, you did see like far more equitable distribution of resources that instead of 500 to one, maybe you're dealing with five, six, seven to one in terms of the wealth disparity between the higher levels of society. So obviously we can look at these two things and kind of try to coordinate something um, that will be that, that will prevent what happened in the Soviet Union. Right. And um, set so cinnamon challenge i think it's less that you got to have no conscience to advance but rather you are rewarded under this system for having no conscience correct correct and and on the on the uh conversely you suffer for your conscience right conscientious consciousness con, con, conscientiousness <laughs> Uh, okay. So in 1970, on what was called Environment Day, President Richard Nick Nixon intoned, what a strange creature is man that he fouls his own nest. With that utterance, Nixon was helping to propagate the myth that ecological crisis we face is a matter of irrational individual behavior rather than being a social of a social magnitude. In truth, the problem is not individual choice, but the system that imposes itself on individuals and prefigures their choice. Behind the ecological crisis is the reality of class interest and power. An ever-expanding capitalism and a fragile, finite ecology ecology are on a calamitous collision course. It is not true that the ruling politico-economic interests are in a state of denial about this. Far worse than denial, they are in a state of utter antagonism toward those who think that the planet is more important than corporate profits. So they defame environmentalists as eco-terrorists, EPA Gestapo, Earth Day alarmists, tree huggers, and purveyors of green hysteria and liberal claptrap. Claptrap. Have you ever heard claptrap before? Clap, yeah, I've heard I've heard claptrap a lot for some reason. But the 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 funniest thing is that like people in the '90s really liked alliteration. Like, go back and watch like any news story, right? And like from the '90s, and you'll find like so much alliteration; it's wild. <laughs> um, uh, my really- my one response to this would be: the more that we nationalize, uh, the more that we bring down the economic disparity, which means that those like lobby and influence our political structure and our media uh, may be brought to heel a little bit more, and we may be able to achieve a little bit more of a genuine democracy through some pretty significant nationalization, some cooper- some some combination of uh, nationalizations in terms of the the, the largest uh, industries as well as the. Um, uh, uh, resources like general resource extractions and everything like that from the nation. And then at the lower level, more of a cooperative um, type of structure for like very small businesses that the state doesn't need to be running. So PVK, I would highly recommend looking into um, how a lot of first nation governments, right. And economies are structured. Right. And I know that decolonized Buffalo podcast, um, he has this, uh, this this google drive with a lot of resources in it that like i'll try and post and chat in a minute but like i would take a look at his podcast and where they talk about those issues right and this is also why i'm totally for um you know the all land back right um because uh when when you say that what what, what is it uh democratic systems right i don't feel comfortable and hold our government accountable either right um, there's no difference between business and government. It's the same thing, 
So don't even think of it as like two separate things because they, they run hand in glove. Right. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I'm for um, giving all the land back and giving it back to like, you know, a people that like, you know, understand right like the, why would they want to get it back just to keep things going as it is you know what i mean it's kind of like feeding into that like sort of like white man's fear of like reprisal like they'll treat us exactly as we treated them or that things will just remain the same and we'll just have right. you know indigenous uh you know uh capitalists like running the show and it'll just be a change of aesthetic you know and i i don't see that I, I, I don't see that in every current example where lands are returned to First Nations, um, you know, and I, I just don't see it in like any example given, if you know what I mean. Correct. Uh, you want to do this one? Sure. Conservatives maintain that there is no environmental crisis. Technological advances will continue to make life better for more and more people. 12. What, oh, that's a fucking footnote. One might wonder. Oh, no, you're good. You're Sometimes good. I forget to take those. <laughs> when I, when it's I'm all good. Them. One might wonder why rich and powerful <laughs> interests. <laughs> Just 12. say it and keep it moving. Don't even like, don't even like say anything about it. Just be like for more and more people. 12. One might wonder why rich and 12. Powerful. One might wonder why rich and powerful interests take this seemingly suicidal anti-environmental route. They can destroy welfare, public housing, public education, public transportation, social security, Medicare, and Medicaid with impunity. For they and their children will not thereby be deprived, having more than sufficient means to procure private services for themselves. But the environment is a different story. Wealthy conservatives and their corporate lobbyists inhabit the same polluted planet as everyone else eat the same chemicalized food filled with microplastics and breathe the same toxified air filled with microplastics. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. In fact, they do not live exactly as everyone else. They experience a different class reality, residing in places where the air is somewhat better than in low and middle income areas. This is like some of the shit with like Brazil and shit like that, where like people are like shoved up into the favelas. Uh, they have access to food that is organically raised and specifically specially prepared. The nation's toxic dumps and freeways usually are not situated in or near their swanky neighborhoods. The pesticide sprays are not poured over their trees and gardens. Clear cutting does not desolate their ranches, estates, and vacation spots. Even when they or their children succumb to a dread disease like cancer, they do not link the tragedy to environmental factors, though scientists now believe that most cancers stem from human-made causes. They deny there is a larger problem because they themselves create the problem that owe much of their wealth to it. So this is interesting, like the insulation from the consequences of someone's class objectives, because you live in the nice area where there's no crime rate, where there's none of the like pollution, where there's not like the lacking social services that like your trash is always going to get picked up. And if there's any graffiti on your wall, it's going to get, that will be taken care of within 24 hours. Cause that can't, that can't be a blemish upon this community. Um, the, the broken windows, the broken windows, and, Pat. And, and I'm even really just talking about what happens in the United States. Really, the United States is like an expert, ex, is, is a very well adept at exporting all of the consequences of its political and social system to the third world. Um, you know, when you visit places like Guatemala or India, you are a lot of times living in the, you know, exported poverty that would be occurring in the United States. I think there's a difference between nationalized economy and a privatized economy. In a privatized economy, you have zero input while may consider something nationalized to be public. And otherwise, I think citizens have more options to enforce democracy. Yeah, that was like pretty much exactly my point. Yeah. At least one, even if you don't believe that it would exist, at least it's nominally there. You can just, there's no way to even actualize it unless, like I said, you believe with like vote with your dollar bullshit. Like that matters to Walmart or something. Right. They like don't that. give a shit about your dollar. Like yeah. they will continue to, well, to like and not only swallow up entire neighborhoods throughout the Midwest. Yeah. And not only that, if you've ever heard Yadis Varoufakis talk about uh, the era of techno feudalism. So, um, for, for a while, right, you had markets. You had this, 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 this abstract concept of markets. Now, markets exist online where markets, right. you have to, you're forced to engage with tech companies 
to acquire products. So like you have to use Google, you have to use Amazon. You, you, you don't have to, but the world is moving past you. And if you make some kind of like conscientious objection to using these things, you're limiting yourself severely in terms of like the market that exists and the professional jobs that exist. So, you know, while he's saying that techno feudalism exists now and that we're actually moving out of capitalism is because the, the, the market excel itself is a privately owned entity. Amazon right. is a privately owned entity where, you know, before you engaged in the market where the market was this like thing where it was like some number of stores that maybe you could go to or something like that. Now it's an array of products on another cap, a privately owned entity that is Amazon. So it's right. like, we have no choice but to engage with them at this point. Right. You want to do this one? Surely. Surely. The enormous interests of giant multinational corporations outweigh doomsayer predictions about an ecological crisis. <laughs> Sober business heads refuse to get caught up in the hysteria about the <laughs> environment, preferring to quietly augment their fortunes. Besides, there can always be found a few experts who will go against all the evidence and say the jury is still out and that there is no conclusive proof to support the alarmists. Conclusive proof in this case would come only when we reach the point of no return. F funny thing that. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Rennie obviously didn't write this w before like SpaceX and like Mars might be being colonized. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I mean that like, you know, we're like literally at that point. We're at the tipping point where if like if we hit like two degrees and, and we're, if we hit 1.5, right, and we're at like 1.2 right now, or no, I think it's two is the tipping point. 1.5 is like the point of no return and we're at like 1.2 or whatever degrees celsius like above normal like we're we're fucked we're going into a thermal runaway and there's there's no changing it ecology is profoundly subversive of capitalism that's right you heard it here folks ecology is on our side it needs planned environmentally sustainable production rather than the rapacious unregulated kind it requires economical consumption rather than an artificially stimulated ever expanding consumerism. It calls for natural, low cost energy systems rather than profitable, high cost polluting ones. Ecology's implications for capitalism are too horrendous for the capitalist to contemplate. And because like, look, all the solutions that we're given right now and that we've been told for like the last like 10 fucking years is that like, it's your fault, it's your fault you didn't reduce, you didn't recycle, yeah. you didn't reuse, fuck you, you killed the planet, right? Even though like you could do all of those things, right? From the time that you are born. And I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that literally have been doing that from the time that they're born, right? right. There are kids that like were probably born in some fucking like, you know, hippie free range house that like, you know, they only wear like, you know, clothes that like they, make out of cotton that they hand pick wild you know out in like the fucking fields or some shit right it yeah, doesn't matter bro yeah exactly Do, it literally probably doesn't even change like a decimal point of no um the the global capitalist you know multinational corporation industry no which is, and and that that's the thing about economic uh, ecological regulations, right? Is that, and that's the same thing, like even the concept of carbon tax, what is a carbon tax? It means that, and same thing with pollution. Like if pollution, if, the, if it's a fine for pollution, that can be looked at as an expense as opposed yes. to a deterrent. Like now we're just looked at if the only consequence is money and I have all the money, you know what I mean? Like right. I can, and maybe, it, maybe it's cost less for me to pay the fucking fine than it does for me to uh, implement you know, restructure my whole disposal system to, to, to you're, you're, for, you're forgetting one important detail, Pat. Go ahead. Who, who is making the laws to set the fine? Can the consumer really be separated from this? If we didn't consume their products, who would they produce them for? Who, who um, is, wait, who is making the laws to find the polluter? Right. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, exactly. the, the the government that they buy yeah 
And can the consumer be separated from this? Do, do you think that like every person lives with, or do you think the vast majority of people, especially in America, live within some type of means of, of being to separate themselves from these products that they don't like, you know, go out of their way to create not just a food desert, but a food apartheid to ensure that like, you know, the people at the very fucking bottom are entirely reliant on them having to go to Walmart to get their daily groceries because their only other methods of sustaining themselves is going to the gas station. Oh, the gas station got bought out by the Walmart. Yeah. Um, let's see here. All right, last slide on the chapter, and then I want to go over this Wikipedia page real quick before we uh, wrap up here. Raj Jetty has pieced together an astonishing. Oh, actually, this is from the fucking. This is from the Wikipedia page. Um, I was just, I just kind of threw that in there because I wanted to save it before I decided. I decided that the whole goddamn. I, I just wanted to look at almost the whole goddamn thing because it was all so relevant to what we were talking about. I couldn't even just find little bits and pieces. So socioeconomic mobility in the united states now socioeconomic is just a fancy word for class right um, right so this really you could imagine this is saying class mobility in the united states because i remember from my um classes in my sociology classes that i went through learning about the difficulty of transcending one's class birth the like how likely is it for someone that's born into the lower class to make it to another class and how rigid actually class structures are where inter, inter intergenerationally the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor um so let's look into some of the stats of that here's a this is from 1916 i don't, I don't know exactly what this is supposed to mean question mark going but, uh, up or down you want to look like a fucking old piece of shit like or do you want to look like a idiot. fucking zaddy <laughs> <laughs> um so raj chetty who is a indian american economist pieced together an astonishing series of findings that absolute mobility the chance that a child will go on to earn more than their parents has dropped from 90 percent a near certainty to 50%, a coin toss, that the gap in life expectancy between rich and poor has widened even as that between blacks and whites has narrowed. Can you believe it? And that <laughs> although the chances- Equality, of upward, equality. <laughs> and that although the chances of upward mobility greater deeply from one neighborhood to the next, that nearly every part of America, the path for black boys is steeper. Right. So this kind of just goes over what socioeconomic mobility means. So we'll, we'll, we'll read this real quick, even though I think that we're all somewhat aware aware um oh, oh the there, there mobility, definitely probably was frankster <laughs> yeah so socioeconomic mobility in the united states refers to the upward or downward movement of americans from one social class or economic level to the other through job changes inheritance marriage connections tax changes innovation illegal activities hard work lobbying luck health I like how luck is on here too, or other factors. So uh, we don't. This is, I want to go into the studies themselves. Um, so in recent years, several studies have found that vertical integrational mobility is lower in the U.S. than in some European countries. U.S. social mobility has either remained unchanged or decreased since the '70s. This is a weird part here, and I'm not going to leave it out because I, I feel like this one is a little bit contradict con contradicts the other studies but it says a study conducted by the pew charitable trust fund found that the bottom quintile is 57 percent likely to experience upward mobility and only seven percent to experience downward mobility which sounds like a good thing right um a study published in 2008 showed that economic mobility in the u.s increased from 1950 to 1980 but has declined sharply since 1980 and remember what happened in 1980 um Great that caused God. that sharp decline would you like a jelly bean? Uh, can you can you go back to that that last one before the a study published in two thousand eight? No, this one. No, the other one. What? That yeah, that one. That, that can you see where the footnote is? Like what what are they citing? Pursuing the American dream: economic mobility across the generations. Hmm. You can look at it real quick if you want. Because I know that like a. It, it's Wikipedia, oh. bruv. You know, it's, it's not as if like everybody's going to be uh, super honest about like how and what it part they are quoting. You know what I mean? Eighty-four percent of Americans exceed their parents' family income percents with family income above their parents by quintile. This is size of absolute mobility gains 
um, Americans raised at the top and bottom are like, see, and then that's the weird thing. Cause even in this Americans raised at the top, Americans raised at the top and bottom are likely to stay there as adults. So, um, here's the bottom quintile 43% are stuck at the bottom. Here's the top. So, see, doesn't that seem like a little bit like that, that little snip that they decided to put in there might've been a little bit misleading. Um, yeah. Growth has occurred at every rung of the ladder, but has been the largest at the top. So you see all this growth. There's there's been growth. Look, everyone's growing, but this is the differences of the growth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like everybody's right. doing a little bit better by some by some metric. Like the less than so you have eleven thousand that goes up to nineteen thousand, but then here you have forty nine thousand that goes up to one hundred eleven thousand. You have this massive right. increase at the top, but marginal increases at pretty much every other. Um, are they are they also taking into account inflation? maybe i was thinking about that that like has this been like um through purchasing power parity have has this been yeah. like the equalization i'm not sure most americans experience see this is what they're talking about there's there's a difference between absolute upward mobility and relative upward mobility so most americans experience absolute upward mobility but few experience relative upward mobility what the so fuck? i think this might be this is actually what they're quoting look look they're quoting this right right right, right. Seven, what no uh, go on go on this is what they're talking about. 57% and seven, but I believe that this is the absolute. Okay. So it's not the, the felt mobility. It's exactly just like it's the technical mobility. Exactly. Technically you you've moved up, but you're not going to feel it. Yeah, it's not going to feel <laughs> it. Most sons meet or exceed the earnings of their fathers. Sons raised in the top are most likely to stay in their father's earning group. Men's so I, earnings and the parents' so generation right. contributed more to family income. We effectively live in a caste system at this point. Yeah. Half of Americans exceed their family's wealth. Americans raised in the top have the most variation in wealth relative to their parents. Family wealth is sticky at the top and bottom of the ladder. So here we are again, almost almost um, exactly to the one of uh, you know maintaining the class position of your family. 41% are stuck at the bottom, 41% are stuck at the top. The bottom three rungs of the wealth ladder have compressed during the past generation. Wealth has declined at the bottom and middle, but risen at the top. So now we're looking at what is this exactly? Change in overall wealth distribution from parents' generation to children's generation. You have 7,000 going down to 2,000, 55 down to 44, and then every except this one is gone up by 200,000. I, I think we've proved the point that like, you know, don't believe everything that you see on Wikipedia. And a lot of times it's worth yeah. checking out the footnote and looking at yeah. exactly a, a little snip out of this. That was technically correct, but pretty much is utterly destroyed of any value or relevance really to what we're right. talking about by actually looking at the, this, there's actually great study here that, that Pew research did. Um, blacks are more likely to start in the bottom of the income and wealth distributions blacks have a harder time exceeding their parents family income and wealth than whites and again you might hear us saying all this we are not saying this as some kind of like a genetic inferiority that 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 causes these types of things you know what i mean these are because of systemic issues that are baked into the system right um, relics from the many many decades of um racial disparity right uh blacks are more likely to stay in the bottom and fall from the middle Blacks are more likely to stay in the bottom and fall from the middle again. I don't know what the same thing. Whites have higher family income and wealth across the distribution. Naturally. But and then there's I, some stuff by education. Not like I that, think we get but the, like, you know. I think we get the idea here. Um, I mean in that like, you know, fucking banks and shit like that historically gave, you know, white families loans in order to be able to buy a house, creating mm -hmm. intergenerational wealth that a lot of black families don't have. Correct. Um, so Brookings Institute found that income inequality was increasing and becoming more permanent, sharply reducing uh, social mobility. Where did that come from? It came up with a nice little graph. Oh, look at that. 
Um, income inequality in the United States is oh, that's a whole oh that's a whole other <laughs> Wikipedia page. I'm sorry. Um, a large academic study released in 2014 found U.S. mobility overall has not changed appreciably in the last 25 years for children born between 71 and 96. But fuck. a variety of what <laughs> I said, fuck, that's that's <laughs> us. <laughs> um, but a variety of up and down mobility changes were found in several different parts of the country. On average, American children entering the labor market today have the same chances of moving up in the income in distribution relative to their parents as children born in the 1970s. Um, okay. What? Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. Bullshit. Because then it says here, upward mobility has not declined. Oh, okay, yeah. That's from the New York Times. Yeah, okay. I don't give a fuck what the fucking New York Times says. Yeah. Here's an interesting thing about popular perception. I liked this part too. Many Americans strongly believe that the U.S. is a land of opportunity that offers every child an equal chance at social and economic mobility. The idea of Americans rising from humble origins to riches has been called a civil re religion, the bedrock upon which the American story has been anchored. And part of the American identity, the American dream, this theme is celebrated in the lives of famous slaveholders and Nazi collaborators such as Benjamin Franklin and Henry Ford. And in popular culture, from the books of Horatio Alger and Norman Vincent Payel to the song Moving On Up. So check this out. Can you just read this part for me? I have to send someone a message. about. Of, of, of course he was, Librarian. Of course the guy that wrote that <laughs> said that shit. All right. Which, which thing am I reading? Just go ahead. This is what's right here. The American Dream Report. Okay. A study of the Economic Mobility Project found that Americans surveyed were more likely than citizens of other countries to agree with statements like, people get rewarded for intelligence and skill, people get rewarded for their efforts, and less likely to agree with statements like, coming from a wealthy family is essential or very important to get ahead. Income differences in my country are too large or... It is the responsibility of the government to reduce differences in income. In the U.S., only 32% of respondents agreed with the statement that forces beyond their personal control determine their success. In contrast, a majority of European correspondents agreed with this view in every country but three. Shockingly, not really, Britain, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. Oh, the country that uh, fucking Slavoj is from. The Brookings Institution found that Americans surveyed had the highest belief in meritocracy, 69% nice, agreed, and the statement, people are rewarded for intelligence and skill among 27 nations surveyed. Another report found such beliefs have gotten stronger over the last few decades, as all of our brains have collectively turned into cottage cheese. I like that, that that it's like part of like the civil religion of the United States to kind of like believe these things. Oh, we we live in a theocracy, Pat, and people like to imagine that like oh, it's it's a Christian theocracy or something like that. It's, no, it's at the altar of capital. Yes, and it's at mm -hmm. the altar of the exceptionalism of this country. Correct. And that's why when you go into the Capitol and you look up, you see George Washington at the seat of Jupiter. <laughs> So here's a, uh, now we get into the really important part, which is intergenerational mobility, uh, which is with a really interesting quote. If Americans want to live the American dream, they should go to Denmark. <laughs> so current state, the correlation between parents' income and their children's income in the United States is estimated between 0.4 and 0.6 citation needed. I don't know what that even means. I don't, is that from the Gini coefficient? I don't even really know what the hell that's. It's just 0.4 and 0.6, man. <laughs> <laughs> If a parent's income had no effect on a child's opportunity for future upward mobility, approximately 20% of poor children who started in the bottom quintile in the bottom 20% of the U.S. range of incomes would remain there as poor adults. At the other end of the income spectrum, if children were born into wealthy families in the 20%, only 20% would stay in that top income category if their mo mobile op mobility opportunities are equal to every other child in the country. But Long-term income statistics show this isn't happening. Mobility opportunities are different for poor and wealthy children in the U.S., Obviously, the answer is 0. 0.5. Um, parental, perennial incomes, parental incomes, and parental choices 
of home locations while raising children appear to be major factors in that difference. According to a 2012 Pew Economic Mobility Project study, 43% of children born into the bottom quintile, bottom 20%, remain in that bottom quintile as adults. Similarly, 40% of children raised in the top quintile will remain there as adults. Looking at larger moves, only 4% of those raised in the bottom quintile moved up to the top quintile as adults. That means only 4% of those in the lowest 20% made it to the top 20%. Like it's, um, <laughs> what's the change in perennial incomes? <laughs> Around twice as many, 8% of children born in the top quintile fell to the bottom, which means that you're twice as likely to go from the top 20 to the bottom 20 than you are to go from the bottom 20 to the top 20. But both of those are abysmally small numbers of the, the, the majority of people that inhabit those polar extremes. Right. 30% um, of children born into the top quintile will fall below the middle. These findings have led researchers to con conclude that opportunity structures create and determine future generations' chances for success. Hence, our lot in life is at least partially determined by where we grow up. And this is partially determined by where our parents grew up and so on. So on and so forth. Economic mobility may be affected by factors such as geographic location, education, genetics, culture, race, sex, and interactions among these, as well as family wealth. And so on and so on and so on. Yes, exactly. Uh, famous historical cases, really kind of irrelevant. Henry Ford, Bill Clinton, working class families, you know. Get these guys. fucked. <laughs> so um, this is... Um, You're bringing up people that like are literally already dead or about to die from the yeah. suds. And it was like, kind of weird that like all of this is like an extremely um um like statistically driven approach to everything. And then like all of a sudden they're like, you know Benjamin Franklin, he uh he 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 grew up poor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's like, like okay. who fucking gives a shit? <laughs> oh, thanks. Like who fucking um, cares? We're living in 2023, my guy. Yeah. So here's intergenerational income elasticities for nine developed countries. I have Several seen large. more naked women than Benjamin Franklin has ever seen in his entire life on my phone. Take that, Ben. I know he's jealous about that. He would be. He was a dog. He, yo, he was a perv. Yeah. Several large studies of mobility in developed countries in recent years have found the U.S. among the lowest in mobility. One children called Do Poor Children <laughs> Become Poor Adults? Sorry, it was kind of like... <laughs> the most important distinction, and I have owned zero <laughs> slaves. I've never even been close to owning a slave. <laughs> I've barely... I, I've never had an employee. <laughs> I've never operated a mill of any kind. <laughs> a mill. <laughs> so, Do Poor Children Become Poor Adults? found that of nine developed countries, the United States and the United Kingdom had the lowest intergenerational vertical social mobility with about half of the advantages of having a parent with high income passed on to the next generation. The four countries with the lowest intergenerational income elasticity, i.e. the highest social mobility, were Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Canada, with less than 20% of advantages of having a high income parent passed on to their children. See the graph. Um, Joseph Stiglitz contends that Scandinavian countries change their education systems, social policies, and legal frameworks to create societies where there's a higher degree of mobility that made their countries more into the land of opportunity than America once was. Um, so you notice all state initiatives that would change these types of things, all systemic initiatives that would be, um, achieving these types of things. Oh, Joseph Stiglitz, former vice president uh, and chief economist of the world bank of yeah the world wanna... yeah he yeah. there's some quotes from him in the divide that apparently he has some like rebukes for those systems ever since he retired from them right. um uh pvk to answer your question it appears that in canada the united states is over twice over double it looks like don't, don't don't you worry child <laughs> you're if you're in canada you're well on your way According to Jason DePaul, at least five large studies in recent years have found the United States to be less mobile than comparable nations. A project led by Marcus Janty, an economist at the Swedish University, found that 40% of American men raised in the bottom fifth of income stay there as adults. That shows a level of persistent disadvantage much higher than in Denmark, which is 25%, and Britain, which is 30%, a country famous for its class constraints. Meanwhile, just 8% of American men at the bottom rose to the top fifth. 
That compares with 12% of the British and 14% <laughs> of the Danes. Despite frequent references to the United States as a classless society. Why do people keep saying that? About, they just say it enough. It'll be true, man. About, just keep saying it. <laughs> about 62% um, of Americans, male and female, raised in the top fifth of income income stay in the top two fifths, according to research led by the Economic Mobility Project of the Pew Charitable Trust. Similarly, 65% born in the bottom fifth stay in the bottom two fifths. This okay, is the graph that I brought up earlier. Um, I am influenced by Led Zeppelin and when I say the word child, not, not trying to be problematic. <laughs> um, in 2000, this is what I went over earlier when we were talking about Canada, if everybody remembers. Um, Even though Led Zeppelin USA is all the way problematic up there. thinking about it. What? This is that thing that I was looking at earlier that I brought up when we were talking about Canada. So I pretty much read through this one already. Um, if you weren't here, uh, this is a graph that plots the relationship between income inequality and, and social mobility. And the United right. States, um, um, countries with low levels of inequality, such as Denmark, Norway, and Finland, had the greatest mobility. While two countries with the highest level of in inequality, Chile and Brazil, had some of the lowest mobility. So you can see them all the way out here. And then you can see all these ones um, clustered down here. Oh, yeah. And that's like the other thing. Uh, Sebs brings up an excellent point that mm -hmm. like, did you know, Scandinavia only developed social democracy out mm -hmm. of fear of the USSR and possible class consciousness occurring in their countries due to the physical closeness to the USSR. Mm -hmm. well, not, only More than that, any not only that, did, not only that, weren't there a lot of socialist party representative, res representatives elected to their political structure during the times that many of these advances were made? Like yeah. maybe they didn't have a fully, maybe they didn't have a fully um, socialist system, economic and social system, but in their, like having seats in their Congress or their Senate or however it's yes. referred to in those countries, there was many people of the socialist or the communist party that were there making great pushes for, um, you know, social programs and workers' rights and things like that. Yes. Ben Burgess talks about this constantly. I know that he's Burgess. Burgess? Burgess? <laughs> Bur I thought it was Burgess. Burgess. I don't know. Sorry. Bur I don't Bur Burgers. I don't talk to that guy. Me neither. Yes. And that's the other thing is that I believe that uh, Norway has more of their um, resource extraction industry privatized than Venezuela. Oh, didn't Venezuela they also? With its devastating, uh, devastating socialism. Didn't didn't they um, basically find all of that oil rich land on land that was occupied by the Sami people? So they, Who the you know, fuck is that? Sorry, <laughs> I, had to do a Conor McGregor. I just had to do a Conor McGregor impression. Who the fuck uh, is that? I uh, I'm pretty certain that the Norwegians were another one of those countries where they had a bunch of like Sami people, the indigenous people there, um, that like you know were just kind of on top of that land and uh through, did i say privatized uh, what is it you mean nationalized not privatized i was just making yeah, sure what, there was whether it's nationalized or privatized the the point is i'm still pretty certain that there was uh indigenous people living on it and then uh you know they weren't i was looking for a nice graph that could show me the percentages of um, nationalization, but they're just not giving it to me. They're just not giving it to me. There's a bunch of articles here that you can see. Oh, yep, 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 yep. Norwegians, uh, yep, stole a lot of land from the Sami people. And in order for them to like, you know, uh, even be recognized by, uh, like, you know, the Norwegian government, they have to own like a certain amount of reindeer. Are you kidding me? You're joking, no, right? No, I'm not at all. They have to, that's like their primary means of like, you know, um, income is reindeer herding. Okay. Yeah. I said more privatized than Venezuela. I meant more nationalized, more nationalized. Sorry, everybody. Other other way around, yeah. Um, man, and Any really solutions based readings? Uh, yeah, I would check out. Um, what is it? The Red Deal. I mean, I, I haven't read it. Check it out. You know, I would just read the divide. Of, yeah, or read the divide. He read talks the divide. about it. Yeah, we we read it on stream. We, we took like a month to read it. 
I, I know it's not your fault that you may or may not have been here, but like the divide went over a lot of solutions at the end mm -hmm. and none of them included overthrowing a government. Yeah. Yeah. It was very, very like middle, not, I wouldn't say middle of the road, just very, like very progressive state initiated, um, um, reform processes that we could go to to alleviate a lot of the poverty in the world also jason hickel has an excellent video on youtube um about uh the uh nor what is it the scandinavian system i think oh i'm not sure i, I haven't watched a lot of that have his youtube Nordics, Nordics, that's it. Shout out yeah. to Jason Hickel. Thank you for the, thank you for the, the necessary. Uh, <laughs> Not to be confused with yeah. Jackson Hinkle. It just needs to get brought up every single time that we mention it. Oh, look, and it's even in the title and it's solutions. Look at that. Oh yeah, no. PVK, you're gonna absolutely love it. It's a great book, and it's really easy to read too. It's like it's super. Um, what's what's the word? He's got a voice, kind of like Parenti, where it, it's just it's not jargon heavy or anything like that. But also, he does also give respect to Fidel Castro and Thomas Ankara and Kwame Nkrumah and Patrice Lumumba yeah. and uh, those that fought for greater resource control and self-determination in their countries, which was undermined by uh, the United States, either through the CIA or through predatory lending uh, institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. Oh, whoopsie daisy. No, How much no. more is this? What? How much more is this? Is Just a few more minutes because I gotta get I gotta get food anyway. We um, haven't even gotten. It's ten o'clock. I know, I know. Hickle, hickle like pickle. Hickle like pickle. <laughs> yes, hickle like pickle. So even though uh, mobility has gone down, most Americans still have more income than their parents. Two thousand seven study, Economic Mobility Project, cross generations. Sixty seven percent of American who are children in nineteen sixty eight. Um, and higher levels of real family income between 1995 and 2002. Um, although most of this growth in total family income can be attributed to the increasing number of women who work since male earnings have stayed relatively stable throughout this time. Hey, thanks for being here, PVK. Thanks for all the, like, you know what I mean? I, we've had a lot of people that were like, you, you bring really enga like engaging, uh, you know, questions, you know, like a very polite way. And we're glad that you're here for that. Yes. Cause we've had some like really, really um, toxic people that come in here and you've been absolutely like delightful in the way that you pose certain questions to the thing that we're reading. So I appreciate you. See you. Uh, what is it? Wednesday. Yeah. Come check us out on Wednesday. Um, where we're going to be reading the sword and the shield. Hey, we appreciate you. We're just learning along with you. Yeah. Everybody's just learning. You know, I just got this food on my desk. So what do you think? Should we call it? I I, th I think we've investigated the, the wiki on uh, social mobility in the U.S. sufficiently. And I feel like if, you know, our viewers want to check it out, like, you know, on their yeah. own. Tons of data. Wanna, yeah. And if they want to talk about it. The gender and race, immigration. Um, so lots and, of interesting impact of incarceration even damn actually this would be cool and yeah but even we stuck this at the end after we did the entire slide process and all of our videos and everything so yeah no the, we're you done. know no we're done that's it we, yeah that's it. we jumped into the wikipedia page at the end of chapter nine all right there's all like that. a there's like a little bit of something he says about like you know fucking how much people can the earth possibly take or whatever but like you mm -hmm. know it's being written in like 97 or whatever so it's just like it's whatever right like has been removed from the black shirts and reds and is being placed in actually i should use my washington bullets i should use my washington bullets bookmark that i got from leftward books in new delhi india yeah <laughs> that should be the one that i use for the stream books oh. um but yeah thank you so much everybody 
We are done with black shirts and reds. Tune in on Wednesday for the first. Uh, yeah, of course. And for all of our viewers that may not have been able to make it for the live on Twitch, you know, when we upload this onto YouTube, or rather when I upload this onto YouTube, right? I always include a link to the Discord below. And if you would like to talk about this more, if you think there's something that we missed while you're reading it independently, which hopefully you are, you can join our Discord, you know, and you can reach us and I'll drag Pat into the discord to make him answer your question right or discuss something with you if it's uh, something on your mind all right so uh thank you stream thank you chat i don't know why i said stream um thank you parenti for this thing. yeah thank you michael parenti god bless you wherever you are you know i hope uh, that's the great gatsby curve um You're good, Tiny. Tiny group, you're the best. Sorry that you weren't able to make it earlier and that we couldn't accommodate you further. I promise I'll try and upload it on YouTube real fast. Um, but you know, again, God bless Michael Parenti wherever he is right now. I hope that, like, you know, he's uh, being showered with love, you know, from his loved ones, and uh, I hope he's doing good. So, and again, just and yeah, I couldn't agree more. To all love to Parenti. Um, tune in on Wednesday, the first stream for the beginning of Black History Month, where we're going to be reading the revolutionary lives of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, dispelling some of the whitewashed uh, notions of their legacies and putting it into the proper context of what their true revolutionary aims were. So can't wait to start a new book with you guys. Uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks for being here. All right. Who the hell is even still streaming? All right. Your options are Luna Oi or Famous Horse. Those are the two that I feel like rating out to. Last, we did horse last time, didn't we? Did we? Yeah, hit up Luna. Yeah, all right, all right. We'll just Luna. Well, because we did him because he was he he jumped on our stream, so then we raided him yeah, on Friday. Yeah, dude, still only felt right. Luna. Yeah, let's do Luna this time. All right, is that how she spells her fucking name on here? All right, bye everybody. I gotta eat. All right, go eat. Freak Museum. All right, Freak Museum then. Oh, God damn it. Uh, why won't it let me do it? Is that how you spell their name? Oh, it's the Freak Museum. Okay, I love you all. I'll uh see you Wednesday. I like Luna too. Like, you know, yeah, but we should switch it up. We should, you know, give uh, our, our fellow uh, people out there just grinding, you know, a little bit of love every once in a while. Luna's not going anywhere. And uh, hopefully one day we get to meet her IRL and give you a stream with her. Lost Salam, stay strong out there.